Uh, well, welcome everybody to this uh, meeting of the Angus um, Joint Board. Um, I'll let Karen go through some of the housekeeping to begin with. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, Chair. Um, just to confirm, um, earlier today we'd actually noted we had um, technical issues in actually undertaking live streaming. So unfortunately we can't live stream today, but we are still going to record the meeting, which will be um, uploaded to the Council's YouTube channel at the conclusion of the meeting. Um, if we can ask everyone who's who's in the meeting today if they can actually use the raised hand option on the screen, it makes it easier to identify if anybody's got any questions. Please be aware of any background noise and if anybody's going to be leaving the meeting, if you can let us know just so that we can actually note that for, for the minute. And that's all I've got to say at the moment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, so if we just move on to uh, the, the first item on the agenda, um, which is regarding the uh, chair and vice chair. So um, as you'll see, it states the members are advised that um, the NHS Tayside board at their meeting the 27th of August appointed myself as chair to the IJB and Angus Council at their meeting on the 10th of September, agreed to appoint uh, Councillor Lois Speed as uh, vice chair to the IJB. So this is obviously my first meeting um, as chair and I just wanted to say I'm very much looking forward um, to working with everyone and to supporting the staff and um, the voluntary services, the carers across Angus as we enter what is likely to be a very uh, challenging winter period. Um, I'd also like to thank Councillor Speed, um, my predecessor, um, and also Hugh Robertson for his, in his role as vice chair for their contributions uh, to the Angus IJB. Um, I'm very glad that Hugh's staying on as an IJB member um, and also glad that Lois is uh, taking up the vice chair role um, and she will no doubt keep me right um, throughout. So moving on to uh, item two on the agenda, um, apologies. Karen, do we have apologies? Uh, the apologies I've got from Gary Malone, um, Hayley Mearns intimated that she was substituting but she's not in the meeting and apologies from Charlie Sinclair and Karen Fletcher is um, his proxy. Okay, thank you. And uh, moving on now to declarations of interest. Does anybody have any declarations of interest they want to raise just now? Uh, I see Peter. Yep, um, a, a declaration of interest, non-financial interest in agenda items 10 and 11 uh, as an unpaid carer. Thanks, Peter. Anybody else? Uh, Councillor Bell. Thank you, Chair. Um, items 12 and 13, a non-financial interest. I'm an elected member, board member of Voluntary Action Angus, and I'll stay and it doesn't affect my ability to vote or discuss, thanks. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Okay, thanks for that. Uh, moving on now, um, agenda item number four is the minutes, including action log. Um, so for the minutes, you'll have all seen these. Um, does anybody have any comments on these minutes? And I don't, don't see any. And are we happy, therefore, to approve these as an accurate record? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, moving on now to the action log. Uh, Gail? Yes, Chair. Um, the action log is self-explanatory. If you look down at the amber points, all of these points are on target. Sorry, my technology's coming in and out here. Um, they're all on target. There was one area in red and that is on the agenda today, Chair, and that was for yourself for the audit committee situation. Okay, thank you very much. Does anybody have any uh, comments or questions on these? No. Okay, um, if we move on to the, the next item on the agenda is the uh, audit committee, um, the minutes of the audit committee, and uh, these are for noting. Does anybody have any uh, comments on these? No. Okay. So moving on to item five on, on the agenda is the appointment to the uh, IJB audit committee. 
Um, so members are advised that there is a long-standing vacancy for a member of the IGB to, appoint it, to be appointed to the IGB Audit Committee. Um, and members are advised that the chair, the vice chair, uh, the chief officer and the chief finance officer of the IGB cannot be nominated as a member. Um, as I understand it, we haven't had any uh, nominations for the audit committee as yet. Um, we will have a new NHS. Oh, sorry, I can see Sandy waving there in the bottom screen. Sandy, did you want to come in at this point? Yeah, th thanks, Chair. Sorry, I, I can't remember exactly how to put my hand up in, in Zoom, but um, we have actually, I, I'm hoping, got a, a volunteer who would take up that role on the audit committee. Um, so uh, there's another hand gone up. Uh, so Chris Boyle uh, has, has volunteered over the last couple of weeks, and I think it would be really grateful if, well, Chris has got his hand up, if we were able to take forward uh, Chris's nomination to, to take, become a member of the audit committee. Okay. Julie, did you want to come in as well there? I saw your hand was waving. Yes, please. Thank you. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to Chris for volunteering. I think having staff side representation on the audit committee is actually incredibly helpful. And I think it, it sends a very powerful message too. I'm really pleased and thank you very much, Chris. I look forward to having you on board. Thanks, uh, Councillor Bell. Thanks, Sandy. Yeah, looking forward to uh, contributing to the work of the Audit Committee and uh, learning lots from it as well. Uh, every day is a school day uh, for me in my role uh, as Units and Branch Secretary. So thank you for, for considering me. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Thanks for that, Chris, and thank you for stepping forward into that role. No problem. Um, moving on now to item six, we have the um, finance report. Um, and you will note the recommendations are on this report are that um, the IJB notes the overall projected financial position. Um, regarding the large hospital set aside note the need to develop a more considered uh, review of this component as part of the overall review of the settlement with NHS Tayside. Note the progress with the strategic financial plans planned interventions, notes the risks documented in the financial risk assessment, and notes the update regarding reserves set out in Appendix 3, including supporting the reallocation of £500,000 of reserves from the financial planning reserve to the strategic planning reserve. Uh, and I'll hand over to Sandy now. Yeah, thanks again, Chair. Um, yes, yeah, so we, uh, we've got another finance report uh, you in front of everybody today. Um, as with uh, the report we presented uh, to the last committee, um, the impact of COVID is, COVID is set out in this report. Um, and while we are kind of moving through the financial year, there is still uh, a great deal of uh, uncertainty regarding the financial impact of COVID in terms of the costs it will exposed to the IGB. And we described the characteristics of some of those uncertainties at the last meeting. Uh, we actually put this uh, report together based on the financial position at the end of August. Uh, we would often try and use the most current information, which would be September information, but the timing of our September information coming together didn't uh, synchronise perfectly with today's meeting. Um, since we put this information together, we have received further confirmation of Scottish Government funding. Uh, the exact amount of that money hasn't been confirmed, but is a, it's another stage of interim funding. Um, so that does help us and it uh, kind of helps us reduce some of the financial risks. And I am kind of uh, in increasingly feeling uh, we, given the, the level of funding that's coming through from the, from the Scottish Government, we will be uh, increasingly likely to be able to absorb the costs of the net costs of COVID within the Scottish uh, Government funding. Uh, once it's eventually confirmed further on in the financial year. So that's that extra funding that we, re, we were uh, made aware of at the start of this month uh, is another helpful uh, support in terms of our uh, financial response to COVID. It's, it's worth also flagging up that the, the net cost of COVID in pre, maybe the first six months of the year uh, may not be as big as we perhaps thought they would be if we were looking back two or three months ago. Um, however, of course, we, we also still do not know how long costs will endure in the system, and effectively how long our COVID response uh, will, will uh, see us um, have to manage uh, escalated costs. And I think you all understand that the uncertainties of COVID uh, translate into uncertainties uh, with respect to financial projections. Uh, so as in summary, I am probably more confident now than when we were able to kind of document the report that you've, you've seen in front of you today. It's worth highlighting a few other aspects though, of the report, 
Um, the report does note that we are seeing some delays in our some of our strategic or planned interventions, the things that were designed to help us balance our budgets. Um, now that is something that the government are aware of. Um, but those those uh, delays and those impacts on those planned interventions will also affect ne the next financial year. Uh, it, it doesn't neatly wrap itself up into a three or six month period. There will be a long term effect of that. So that's something that we're going to have to be particularly aware of as we go through our financial planning over the next few months and will have an impact into the next year. Um, we've listed a series of risks in the, in the report, and it's always important to kind of highlight that we have got a number of financial risks beyond just COVID. There are a number of risks that's be, that have been there for, for some time. Um, the Chair, you've also already mentioned that we have a, um, a recommendation in with regards to reserves. Hopefully that's explained fully in the paper. Uh, and a couple of things just to kind of wrap up. We have now made contact with NHS Tayside regarding the large hospital set aside, and that's part of us moving towards uh, that, that recommendation in the paper uh, about that subject. Um, and it's also important to note in the final um, appendix, which is about uh, governance updates, we are um, increasingly having to acknowledge that our capacity to deal with everything that we aspire to deal with um, is probably would probably stretch us too far. And I don't exactly know how far that, that will compromise us in terms of some of the, the, our aspirations regarding governance improvements, but we have flagged up one area which we feel we'll probably have to put back a bit. Uh, and in the final page of this report on Appendix 4, uh, the third row across that table talks about reviewing corporate support arrangements with partners. Um, we note the, the implications for the change of um, status in that, but what we have said in the commentary is we, we realistically now do not expect to be able to develop that as far as we would have hoped in this financial year. Um, these governance issues that, that are captured in, the, in, in this part of the report have always been the more complicated ones. They do require us being able to work with uh, multiple partners and effectively they require all partners have the capacity to deal with these discussions in one, at one time. And we don't really realistically feel we or the partners are going to be in a position to, to deal with that as we might have hoped with in, in, in a different financial year. So we have said that, uh, set that out here, um, but it is, I suppose, worth noting that that is a kind of an indirect consequence of, of COVID affecting not just our capacity, but also the capacity of our partners. So that's where I'll stop, but I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, th thanks very much for that, Sandy. A very helpful report as always, um, and I think some good news regarding the uh, the government funding coming through um, regarding COVID costs. Um, I just had uh, one question and one comment, if that was okay, before I before I opened it up. Just my question was regarding um, point three, point two, point five, um, where you state that the IGB intends to be able to share more consistent and regular financial information with the other Tayside IGBs. Um, and I, I just, I, I'm assuming yes, but I'm, I'm, I, they, have they also committed to that uh, sharing of financial information? Uh, they haven't actively committed to that, but I, 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 I kind of half hope that um, by us uh, ha having a go at doing this in a, in a more structured way than we have managed them before, that it will set a precedent for uh, kind of reciprocal arrangements. Um, it'll be easier for me to ask for that if we have gone first and, and tried to get on the front foot with this. And I, I would like to think that that would, would come through um, you know, over the next uh, maybe two or three quarters. A lot of this um, is about capacities and systems to kind of uh, um, develop reports and, and start to put them into the right place in systems. Um, and over the last few years, we have struggled to do that um, ourselves, as will others. But I'm hope, hopeful if we can uh, get on the front foot with that, that our partners will start to reciprocate in due course. Okay, thanks for that. And, and just my comment was really in, in relation to your, your last comments on the report. Um, I, I found the appendix for the, the, um, the uh, governance, financial governance was very, very useful, very interesting. And, and it struck me that um, many of those were tied in with the review of the integration scheme as a whole. Um, just being mindful as we go through that review period, um, how that could affect some of what's listed in that appendix. Yeah, Chair, you're, you're definitely right. Um, the issues that um, are listed there will be very familiar to people on the audit committee and probably familiar to people around the whole uh, IJB. The things that um, are generally, I'm actually not sure if I can say exclusively, but often they're dependent on our ability to work with other people. 
uh, the other partners. And uh, you know, some of them are more complicated and uh, you know, they're complicated anyway, but they're also complicated by the fact we have to work with other part partners. And you are right to, to link that to the, the integration scheme and uh, the general improvements in, in that kind of uh, structure of the way we work with our partners. Um, so it would be um, a hope or an aspiration that as we get into a further review of things like the integration scheme, we would be able to resolve some of these issues. Um, you know, and, and that whole process is another of these that will take time uh, to, to work through, to develop the right position and to make sure everybody's um, in the right place in terms of approving uh, a new uh, way of working going forward. Okay, thank, thanks very much for that, Sandy. Do we have any uh, comments or questions for Sandy? Peter? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, Sandy, thanks for the report. Good one as usual. I had highlighted Appendix 4, um, column or line 3, actually. Um, this has been outstanding for four years now. Um, and the MSG review that came out in uh, what a year ago, 18 months ago, said that in, in uh, Section 2.5 said the uh, support should be provided. And I, I understand where everybody is at the moment with COVID, but would it be sensible for maybe the chair or yourself of the audit committee to write to the other partners and say, when we've all taken breath, I don't know if it'll be March or April or whenever next year, that we, we need to address this as a priority, um, just to get their confirmation that it's no longer going to be kicked down the road. I mean, it's like four years since we've actually resolved, uh, resolved this issue. Okay, yeah. Thanks, Peter. Um, yeah, this has been um, an unresolved issue for quite some time. And we, we did have a corporate support arrangement in place at the outset of the partnership. Um, but as the, as the partnership moved into perhaps its second and third year, we, we realised that things needed to improve. So we had a, had a go at doing this at the outset in, in 2015, 2016, 17, as we were starting the partnership. Then we realised that things did need improved and, and, and moved on and developed further. But certainly in terms of the, the one for, for corporate support, I think um, you know, our aspiration would be that that would be part of the, the kind of broader review of the, the integration scheme and, and the way we can improve things from that. So I think uh, if Gail was OK about it, we, you know, and she felt that that was a, a sufficient priority, we could make a, a note uh, in our kind of work plans that we would share with our, our two partners about the priority we need to attribute to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I was looking for some sort of um, semi-formal or formal confirmation that they would agree to that sort of plan, um, a, a response from them to say yes. Sandy, I'm, I'm supportive of that. Right, we will um, uh, put something together uh, to that effect. And if it's OK by the chair, we'll put it under the chair's, chair's name. Uh, we'll obviously run it past you before we, before, before we send it, but we'll, we'll share that with, with the, the chair. Um, and I think we have captured in, in, in this particular point uh, about corporate support arrangements under the implications of the status that we do know that shortcomings in the corporate support do hold us back a wee bit. There is no yeah. doubt about that. So it's, it's completely fair for the likes of Peter to flag that one up. And uh, you know, we are, it, we, to some extent, we're kind of saying the needs must. We are trying to all still respond to COVID right now. And that's why we were saying it's not gone away. We know it's priority, but we just know we're not going to get that job properly done mm -hmm. in the current circumstances. Sure. Are you happy with that, Peter? Yes, thank you. Yeah, that's fine. That's good. Any other questions or comments for Sandy? Chair yeah, Hugh Robertson and Councillor Bell. I don't he, know who was first. <laughs> Hugh, Hugh looks like he's come in first. <laughs> okay, thanks, Chair. Uh, thanks for that report and update, Sandy. Just a couple of points from me. The indication in the report is that um, an update in large hospital services will be included within the next finance report. Um, we'd agreed at the last IJB that we would get a, a separate report on the, the large hospital set aside. Um, so your comment on that, please. And my second question is just a wee bit more background. You're asking us to approve a recommendation um, to transfer £500,000 reserves into um, the strategic planning reserves. Just uh, could you explain what that money is going to be used for within that reserve? Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so in terms of large hospitals set aside, um, 
yeah, we're happy. I'm happy to do a separate report. I've, I probably felt that we could, uh, when in writing that report, that we could probably um, capture it in a in a you know, separate appendix to the to the financial report. But I'm happy to if the if the group is all agreeing, and I assume we are, uh, to to put that into a separate report to the IGB. So we'll work on that basis unless we agree otherwise. Due. So hopefully that's okay. In terms of the um, the reserve and the uh, request to move five hundred thousand pounds from one to another. Um, what we're trying to recognise there is that uh, within the strategic planning reserve, uh, which would normally we'd expect to last for you know, two or three years, um, at the last IGB board meeting, we made a pretty significant commitment against that to try and bolster our project programme management uh, resource. Uh, now, when we've looked at that over two or three years, that in itself will consume, let's say, and I, I'm just going to use this as an example, four to 500,000 pounds. When you look at, at two or three posts, over two or three years. Uh, so having made that commitment, and I think it's something we, we tried to explain and, and put down the rationale for that in the, in the last IGB report, that puts quite a strain on that strategic planning reserve. And we felt it was probably appropriate to bring some more resource in there, just continue to allow us to do other things that we've, we've spoken about under the auspices of that strategic planning reserve. So it was really just trying to adjust our reserves to reflect the commitment we made at the last meeting to try and bolster our uh, program management and planning support over the next, you know, the next phase of our thinking. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Um, again, I mean, just support Peter and Hugh's uh, remarks about the large hospital set aside. And um, I guess I just wanted some comfort from Sandy that in those discussions, our partners are on the same page there because for me it kind of ties into the discussion we had this morning uh, around directions and, and my fingers hovering over the direction required button there um, I, I, and I, I guess you know I'd like some security around knowing that we're going to avoid that or is that something that we are going to need Right. Thank you, Councillor Bell. Well, you were right to, uh, again, link the issue of directions with things like the large hospital set aside. Uh, the large hospital set aside is a, a resource that the uh, IGBs across the country uh, have responsibility for the st strategic oversight of. Um, and one way we would formal formalise that or document that would be through the use of directions. Um, and I, I mentioned in one of the questions I put to the, in, into the discussion earlier on today was, some of the resources that the, the IGB is involved with are, are very close to the to the IGB in terms of they are managed through the partnership, and some are more distant. And the um, the large hospital set aside would be one that is slightly more distant. So uh, I think you're right, I say, to, to make the link to directions. And I don't think it would be un, unnatural for us to do that, uh, to, to use directions in that kind of context. Um, I think we have we've written to NHS to say just sharing some thoughts. We've done that, I think, uh, maybe a couple of weeks ago through uh, Gail and myself. Um, and we've shared some uh, ideas about you know, our, our initial thinking and the ways we would be able to take things going forward. So we're just waiting on, on a reply from that. Um, when we get that reply, we will start to share that with the board in terms of, you know, we won't necessarily wait for the, um, the uh, December IJB, although I'm accepting that we will do a separate report on that. You know, if there's something that we can, of substance that we can share with the board, we'll start to do that to keep the, you know, get the ball uh, moving a bit quicker. Um, but that should also flush out if we're all on the same kind of page in terms of taking that issue forward going uh, over the next uh, couple of years. You happy with that? Okay. Are there any other questions for Sandy? No, I don't see any others. So um, are we happy with the um, recommendations contained at the start of Sandy's report? Okay, thank you. So if we move on to item seven, which is the Angus Mental Health and Wellbeing Update. Um, this was a, a report that was requested at the last meeting. Um, very interesting report. And I think I'd really just like to highlight um, in, in terms of the content, um, the work towards the, the creating the seven day service and also the two case studies uh, that are contained within the appendix, one from Angus Creative 
minds and the other um, on the ANP role. Um, I think both are very helpful uh, in terms of showcasing some of the very good work that's happening um, in Angus at the minute. Um, and I'll hand over to Bill now to talk to the report. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, indeed, the, the IGB have been getting updates regularly um, regarding the, the Tayside situation and how Angus fits into that, but I, I felt it was a helpful a challenge at the last meeting to actually ask the question what's happening now in Angus and what difference and what impact is that having on our uh, population so I hope this report goes some way to to address that. Um, reflecting back since mental health uh, moved into the IGB I would say that the biggest development has been an equal priority has been given to mental health well-being uh, as well as mental illness um, and as my report says, um, it is the well-being element that will assist individuals and communities to actually build um, resilience and um, give assurance to its local population. And I think the events of the last nine months has, has, has proven um, that Angus is in a good place to do that, but needs a lot of support in order to make to sustain that over, over many years to come. I've previously again highlighted to the to the IGB board the Angus Mental Health um, and Wellbeing Network, but I think it's important just to to, to summarise that in this paper. Um, that network represents the whole system, um, so it represents statutory services and our third and independent sector users and carers, and it, it includes all ages, so everything from child, adult, older people. Um, with representations with the community planning partnerships and community justice, for example. So that, that network's just gone up to its second anniversary and um, does fulfil an important role in Angus, both as a scrutiny group, so quite rightly scrutinises um, what, what we are doing, but as a, also as a consultation group. And they will be, along with the IGB, um, the two main groups that will feed into the the, the health and wellbeing strategy that's been currently developed um, across Tayside. So that's the background. I just want to go on now just to summarise some of the developments that are happening um, here and now in Angus and that are making changes. And um, the first one there is um, we're doing work around improving our comorbidity or comorbidity pathway. So that is for people who have mental illness as well as substance misuse problems. Um, there's been a number of national reports over as many years as I've um, worked in the health service where um, people fall through the gaps and there's um, debate as to what needs to be treated first, the, me the mental illness or the substance misuse, um, when of course we need to um, actually work with the person and it's, it's not important. Um, what, what the problem is. It's we need to work with um, the individual themselves. Um, Angus are in a good place to do that. So since integration, our substance misuse services have been part of the integrated mental health team. They're co-located um, in Arbroath and soon to be in Montrose. Um, some, some people on the board will be familiar with the Dundee Drug Commission's report. And again, Angus, um, we did a self-assessment, our alcohol and drug partnership did a self-assessment a few months ago, and many of the recommendations um, that were made for Dundee, Angus have achieved, but you know, we're, not, we're not complacent at all, and there are still areas that we need to develop, and the comorbidity pathway um, will be implemented in early 2021. There are pilots happening now, but it'll be formally endorsed in early 2021. Um, section 3.2 describes the enhanced community support for mental health. So we've taken the term ECS, which has been around in Angus for a number of years for older people, and it's exactly the same principles that we believe should be applied um, for, for mental health. Um, we ran a, a pilot in the northeast, um, and that was at a direct request by the local GPs in the northeast. Um, in summary, that is a, a single entry point for all of integrated mental health service. So irrespective of whether it's a secondary care community mental health referral you want to meet, a 
the substance misuse, a psychology referral, or even a referral into our third sector, um, all the referrals will come through one hub that's going to be physically based in the Lynx Health Centre. We have a secured accommodation there. And as the paper highlights, it's multi-agency. And the biggest benefit, there are two main benefits that we think that will bring. It will ensure that the person sees the right person much quicker and therefore commences treatment much sooner. And the other um, benefit we see with co-location in the links with, with primary care is there'll be improved communication um, and partnership working in, in, um, between all partners. So as I say, that's um, due to be launched in January. And if successful, and I can't think of any reason why it wouldn't be, we would adopt that as the, as the model for Angus and um, developing a, a rollout model for the rest of Angus. Seven day working, um, we have um, everything in place and that will be launched now in January in North Angus. Um, I think I mentioned at the last IGB meeting, we now have a clinical lead and a permanent psychiatrist for that, for that patch, Dr. Chris Pell. So that's enabled us to, to, to move ahead with that plan. Um, that would be then tested in the North and fully implemented later in 2021 in South Angus. So all of Angus will have a seven day service. The, the rollout in the South is dependent on a further resource transfer from the inpatient unit. 3.4 concerns um, the advanced nurse practitioners where you've got the case study of and our two senior social work practitioner roles. These two new roles reflect um, changes in our workforce. For example, um, the advanced nurse practitioners will take on roles that have traditionally been um, held by either primary care or consultant psychiatrists. And hopefully the, the description there will tell you the, the contribution that they will bring in supporting primary care to work with people with chronic um, mental health problems who are often in, um, have physical health problems as well. And again, that's a client group that um, their average lifespan is sadly 10 to 15 years shorter than, than the average population. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, that, that's been tested to the full during COVID and, and the case study highlights um, the developments of supporting people into the right types of treatment over the last few months. Our senior practitioner roles, two posts or two post holders commenced in March of this year. And that reflects the, um, the complexity of legislation um, that is around um, for, for vulnerable people, including people with substance misuse and mental health problems. And these two experienced social workers are already making a significant impact into how we do our business. 3.5. Four is the peer support worker. So again, glad to, to report that every GP practice in Angus now has um, a peer support um, worker attached to their practice. That's someone with a lived experience. Um, this morning we had our um, scrutiny meeting with Scottish Government um, and their interest is how we are. This is new funding, it's ring fenced money from Scottish Government um, for um, it's for supporting services, non-traditional services who work with people with mental health problems. So primary care, accident and emergency, prison and health care, custody suites. Um, Angus, as all health and social care partnerships, received ring-fenced funding for that. Um, so we had a very positive meeting and positive feedback from the Scottish Government this morning. Um, again, just linking it to the bigger picture, um, as you know, when the mental health strategy was launched two years ago, the national mental health strategy, it gave a commitment to 800 um, additional frontline workers in mental health. So the, that works out in Angus um, as 17.2 workers. Um, we have until the end of next year to achieve that. But today we are able to report that we have the equivalent of 17.5. So some 18 months earlier, 
we're already in excess of what our um, target was. So the target was 17.2 whole time equivalents, and today we have 17.5, and we have some other posts that are due to come on stream um, in the next 12 months. So that's certainly a, a good news story. Um, Listen, Learn, Change is the action plan that's to address the, the Strand Report, Trust and Respect. So I've given a summary there. Um, Kate Bell, the Mental Health Director, um, is hoping to attend uh, the, the next IGB in December, um, just prior to the draft mental health strategy um, coming out in January. So um, Kate will be able to talk um, to the, the Listen, Learn, Change Action Plan in more detail. Again, just want to highlight that um, Angus is well represented on the strategic board, both statutory professionals and our third sector representation representatives. There's quite a number of subgroups um, and working groups that are all working together to develop the strategy and make significant changes to how TSI deliver its mental health services. Um, as you would expect, um, our report does contain COVID-19 with a focus on, on mental health. Um, as you can see there from the Scottish Mental Health Research Advisory Group, some worrying um, concerning statistics or, or, or points regarding how, me how mental health will be impacted upon um, as a consequence of COVID. And again, it just demonstrates the importance of the whole system across Angus working together. Uh, and again, we've got a um, reference there to Angus Creative Minds, um, who are one of our um, partners and the important role that they play at a very different level to say acute mental health. But again, it just highlights the importance of all the partners working together. Um, really, that's all, all I've got to say at the moment. I'm happy to take any questions, but really just as important that the IGB note and support um, these initiatives and we all collectively take every opportunity to ensure that our, the public and the population of Angus are aware of this as well. But happy to take any questions or comments. Thanks very much for that, Bill. I think some very good examples of whole system working um, in the report um, and it's very useful for us to have a lot of information about what's happening specifically here in Angus. Um, happy to take uh, some questions. I see Gail's hand up, Elaine's hand up and Councillor Bell. Gail, do you want to go first? Yes, and Chair, in light of the discussion we had this morning with the Scottish Government and directions, um, Bill, I think we'll maybe need to take cognizance of Section 3.6 of your report, because we very much now need to recognise the role of the IGB, bring in mind the conversation with Christina this morning. Um, and obviously the strategic decisions about mental health inpatients have to be agreed by all three IGBs. And my understanding is we still haven't got that approval from our IGB with regard to listen, learn and change at this stage. As you've said, Kate Bell has um, requested that she attend our December meeting um, to enable preliminary feedback with regard to listen, learn change. Um, so that will go ahead on the 9th of December. Prior to that, the report will go to our strategic planning group in Angus um, for preliminary feedback to that chair. Thanks for that, Gail. Um, Elaine, you wanted to come in? Yes, I was just going to ask, Bill, if you had any idea, I think the advanced nurse practitioners, but do we have a handle on if they really are going to free up consultant posts? Yes, the, the, the business case to reduce the advanced nurse practitioners um, really focused on the consultants' caseloads. They, they, work, they will work primarily with, with patients who are mentally stable but do have long-term complex conditions. And they are patients that would, would get six-monthly reviews by a consultant psychiatrist um, having the advanced nurse practitioner who will take a much more holistic view, look at their physical health care as well as their mental health, will allow these patients to no longer require to be seen every six months by consultant psychiatrists. So we estimate when they are trained, because they are in training at the moment, that they would have um, quite large individual caseloads, but they, 
but that reflects the fact that they're seeing people that aren't acutely unwell there. They, they, they need um, holistic care. So we could see up between two and 500 individual patients being removed from consultant caseloads. And the long-term plan is that as we review our psychiatry workforce, a resource will move from predominantly employing consultant psychiatrists, which we've never had a full establishment for over five years now in Angus, to advanced nurse practitioners. And I suppose the background to this is I'm preparing a document today and I've been involved in several groups today about actually trying to recruit that consultant workforce. Um, and, and it's really, I suppose, it's, it also echoes that a bit of the large hospital set aside is actually being able to demonstrate that investment in one area allows you to disinvest in another. And I think that is has been a massive challenge all throughout for the health and care services. Um, and I suppose it's seeing what that tangibly would look like um, but also we're realising that, that post COVID we have, we're seeing an increase in referral for mental illness um, coming through. So I, I think it's again, it, it's, it's just seeing how that comes through. Um, and, and I think that is going to be a real challenge actually removing people from mental health posts to replace with another staff group. So I suppose it should perhaps a bit of caution that that may take, we, we may find out that we've got more needs coming through from different areas rather than being able to disinvest in another. And, and I think also probably an assurance to, to the, the IJB that there is an active recruitment um, drive ongoing with an interview date set, and it's for every vacant consultant psychiatrist post that we have in the whole of Tayside, including, including community in Angus and, and inpatient for Angus. So there's a very active group um, working on it, trying, trying to recruit people. Thank you. Thanks very much, Elaine. Um, Councillor Bell, you wanted to come in? Yes, thanks very much. Um, thanks, Phil, for that. I think I'm really starting to feel a bit more confident and optimistic that, you know, we are, we are going in the right direction because for a long time in mental health services in Angus, it's felt quite scary, actually, um, and, you know, worry about people um, who are needing the service. So this is, this is really encouraging. Um, and in the interest of full disclosure, I'm taking a, a motion to council next week, supported by Lois and the third sector, uh, around the, the positive messages we've got and around that more holistic whole system that we, you know, we are developing. Um, and my question is, given the, the level of um, interest at a national level around our mental health services in, in Angus and Tayside. Um, what sort of evaluation is being planned on how well our services will be working? And I'm, I guess I'm kind of hoping that the Scottish Government might be offering some uh, resource to help on that in, in terms of some innovation, um, some creativity around finding out how that whole system is working for people. Um, and I'm particularly interested in the peer support workers. I think it's a fantastic uh, achievement that we've got these workers in every GP practice. Um, and I guess I, I want to know how well it will be working um, as a model of good practice, hopefully, um, that, that others can benefit from. So um, I'm hoping that there's some sort of innovation that we can tap into at a national level to help us identify just how well this this model will work for us and and our citizens yeah if i could just come in there um i think um that would be a good question to pose to to kate at the next meeting about how how all of the the, the initiatives in tayside are going to be evaluated and um, locally the um the peer support service, we, before we got national funding, again, it just shows you how, how advanced ANCAS often is, uh, that the, the locality improvement groups funded health and wellbeing services in um, Bacon Montrose and Carnoustie Money Feath. Carnoustie Money Feath was delivered by peer support workers. So that probably started about three years ago. So that was evaluated approximately 18 months ago and that helped inform the model that we've now got across Angus. So there is an existing um, evaluation of the peer support service, which I can share with you, Councillor Bell. Um, but to summarise, the people that used the service liked it. The, the GPs 
liked it and and, and the professionals working and the peer support workers working in the service liked it so it, it was it was green flags everywhere it was a really positive um report hence the reason why we've, we've rolled that out um, the other level of scrutiny we got is that um, David Strang remains a, a, a formal critical friend of um, Tayside, so um, he is um, regularly meets with, with, with Kate Bell and other executives and um, does scrutinise the, the, the changes that we're making. Thank, thanks for that, Bill. Um, was there anybody else wanted to ask a question? Um, may I? Yes. Yep, Andrew Adley, and I think I've got Andy Jack as well. So, Andrew, do you want to go first? Yeah, I was reflecting on on, on um, Bill's excellent report. Um, I'm, I've been lucky enough to be part of, of the the Mental Health Strategy Writers Group, and it's been a very um, informative and um, illuminating experience. I've, I've really enjoyed my opportunity to participate. Um, the strategy seems to be um, proceeding really well from my perspective, and it'd be interesting to see what Kate says when she does the presentation. I mean, the focus is indeed, as, as Bill says, on well-being and about increasing community support. Um, one of my particular interests is about reducing the reliance on medication as a, as a way of managing mental health and mental illness and about also about building the multidisciplinary team. Um, Bill is right to mention the, adva the advanced nurse practitioners, but we'll need a whole team effort to, to manage the, um, the, the amount of disease burden that Angus and the whole of Tayside Bears. And also one of the themes is prompt access to, um, to assessment and treatment. And so all of these factors need to be taken into account to, to produce a, um, an effective response and, a, and a, an improvement in services. Thank, thanks for that, Andrew. Bill, did you want to come back on any of that or? Yeah, really just to agree in that um, there, is no, there is not one thing that will that will develop mental health services or, or resolve the challenges that we've got. It's it's everything working together. So it is being responsive. So one of the criteria for the health and wellbeing services that people can be seen that week. Um, I lead on the emergency urgent care pathway across Tayside, and you know we're looking at pathways that um, get the person from the, the time of crisis into the right service much quicker. Um, um, than it currently does. So yeah, it's a, it's a combination of local and Tayside initiatives all, all coming together. Okay, and uh, Andrew Jack, did you have a question? Yes, I did. Thank you, Chair. And thank you, Bill, for uh, another great report, as usual. And, and like Councillor Bell, I was very pleased to see the peer support in every GP practice. And to a certain extent, that may may affect the question that I've got. Um, there's been, and, and also this, this may be not the right place to raise it. It might be the winter plan, but I'm going to mention it anyway. Um, there's been a lot of uh, press and discussions on the media about seasonal affective disorders. And in view of this year's situation, and the forthcoming um, winter. I was just wondering how much provision has been made for a spike in uh, demand for mental health services over the, the winter and festive period. I didn't see it mentioned in the winter plan, maybe it is there somewhere, but uh, specifically, from the point of view of, of mental health, I think this is a, a time when especially single people, elderly people are very affected. And um, I wondered if the, the peer support group may be enhanced to anticipate that demand. So I wonder if you've got any views on it, Bill. Yeah. Um, winter planning for mental health. So. Let's acknowledge that this year is unique. This winter is going to be unique. But if you forget about this winter, um, all our data for the last 10 years um, has shown that there's been no change in demand, no increase in demand over the winter months for mental health services. And we have no significant reduction in staffing due to, to staff flu or illness. So winter planning and mental health 
you know, has compared to other services, hasn't been a huge issue. Um, however, we do expect that to change this year because it's going to be accompanied by COVID, obviously. So um, winter planning at two levels, so at an Angus level, we are just ensuring that our services are as flexible as they can be. Um, as part of our um, COVID funding, we have we are working with our third sector providers and if third sector um, are experiencing changes in demand, we can quite quickly um, resource them to, to, to change what, what they can provide. So that, that, that's in place now. Um, the pressure on inpatient beds, there, there's certainly, um, I've been the on-call manager this week, so I've never known pressure on hospital beds like what we've got at the moment and this, we're still in October. So um, again, our seven day working in Angus will, will assist that. So it's again, building up the community to, to support um, the, the pressures on, on, on hospitals. So again, mental health is no different from, from other specialties. I think, you know, just taking the example of seasonal affective disorder, um, I do think that, our third, that the third sector would feel that impact more. You know, it's the softer stuff that, that we need to do. So Angus Creative Minds, we need to work with our third sector to make sure that, you know, loneliness and isolation is, is being um, targeted. So again, it's, it's, it's working together. And yet, I suppose, just to summarise, you know, this year is going to be a bit of an unknown, this winter is going to be a bit of an unknown. Um, so we are going to be learning fast. Hey, do we have any other questions? Um, yes. Yep. Q? Yep, my hand can't be working. Um, like others, uh, I welcome this support um, and it, it clearly outlines the improvements that are taking place uh, within Angus. Um, Julie mentioned the uh, evaluation. I'd like to go one stage further and ask Bill how we're going to measure the success of this. What are the, how do we know that what we're doing is going to make a difference? What are the measures going to be? Um, and my second point is with regard to the seven day working um, and the implication in the career of the day was that this is new and that we're given a commitment to this today. Um, this has been around for some time. Uh, it started off way back in 2017 when there was a Health Improvement Scotland uh, report um, criticising Angus for the lack of such a service. And when uh, Lois was chair, and I don't have the exact date, but it was early 2019, we as an IGB committed um, to implement in seven day, 52 week a year provision in this field. Um, so this isn't new, but at that time, when we approved that, the time scale we were given was that it would be introduced in the north uh, of Angus in uh, January 2020, and in the south of Angus in, in December 2020. Um, now, the time scales are now north January 2021 and south sometime in 2021-22. So the, the wording in, in, in the report actually says for the North, anticipate January 2021. So given this has been around for a wee while, I'm looking for more of a, a firm commitment from Bill that we will implement this in uh, January 2021 in the North. And I'm also asking, is there anything we can do to bring forward, given the importance of this, uh, implementation in the South. Do we know that we're getting this money um, from the uh, centrally? And if we are getting this money, if, if that's a guarantee, is there any way we can use our uh, reserves um, to bring forward the, the uh, appointment of staff to get this service up and running quicker? Okay, you're quite right. The slippage of the seven day service um, has been a major frustration for us. Um, the one factor that's delayed that has been the workforce. So the nurse has been released from CARSU took longer than anticipated, but we got the nurses approximately 18 months ago. Unfortunately, that was the same time when Dr. Roger Blake, the, the locality consultant, um, left Angus. And since then, we've had a number of locum psychiatrists. We felt it was really important, and we discussed this with, with, with our partners, that in order to have a safe seven day service that needed um, 
dedicated clinical leadership from a from a consultant psychiatrist. That's why the service didn't start this year. Um, as I say, we now have Dr. Chris Pell um, starts next week. He's moving from inpatient, so although he's going to be new to Angus community, he's not new to Angus. He he was the consultant responsible for Mulberry when it was there, so it comes with a lot of knowledge. So um, we've got all we've got all the nursing staff, we've got all the medical staff. Um, so there is no reason that I can see that, that why we wouldn't have the service going live from January. I understand that nursing rotas are already in place. With regards to South Angus, um, it isn't just a financial resource. I think there's two things I'll, I'll, I do want to just ensure we get the timing right is we need to learn from the North. So we don't, we don't know what the uptake is going to be. We've done some preliminary work um, but we really need to take our time to ensure that we get this right. And um, we also need to recruit and induct additional staff. Um, and that's, that, we know that was the barrier for the North. So um, with the current workforce challenges, um, although we are, from a nursing point of view, all our nursing posts are filled. I've never known all our nursing posts to be filled ever. So. There is, there is a big light coming along the tunnel at the moment. So we are better placed than we have been all for a long time for workforce, but we can't take that for granted and things can change very, very quickly. So it'll be dependent on the workforce, more so than the, the release of finance. Yeah, it just seems to me, Bill, that December 2017 up to, and is a long time ago. And particularly when we're talking about, I mean, 2021, 22 takes us up to the end of March, 2022 that's a, that's five years mm -hmm. um to try and get something in place i do think that reflects the, the, the workforce challenges um okay um do we have any other questions here yeah, we've got alison clement Yep, and I've got uh, Lois as well, and so that's two two more, okay? And perhaps sorry, and Catherine Lindsay. Okay. I just really wanted to highlight, I'm very supportive of this paper, but one of the reasons I'm supportive is that the biggest risk for our partnership at the moment is the sustainability of primary care. It is our top risk at the moment. And what is described in this paper is about getting the model right for all of our workforce, because we know that our workforce is our um, most precious resource and most scarce resource at the moment. So I'm very supportive of this, but would like to make the point that it's not about finding advanced nurse practitioners um, to replace consultants or um, finding nurses to replace GPs. This is about getting the right model and valuing the contribution of each of these professionals working with you know, the absolute optimal pathways for people and making the best use of everybody. So I support what Andrew Radley was saying there as well about ensuring that we get that absolutely right with an extended multidisciplinary team. I think one of the advantages of this model that is maybe not in the paper, although the paper is very comprehensive, is about the physical health uh, monitoring and the opportunities from aligning the mental health teams within general practice. We know that um, people with mental health have inequalities which might be better addressed by aligning them uh, so that you're addressing their mental health and physical health and social well-being as well all within their communities and be very community facing. I also think that as long with workforce and sustainability of primary care one of our main risks that we are looking at through the IGB also is adult protection and I do think there is opportunities with having an integrated team with social workers included, that we might just uh, improve the way that we're working and the pathways of communication around adult protection with our most uh, vulnerable, including people with a mental health problem. And that really, for me, extends the sort of money faith integrated care model that we've got, which is really working around elderly. And people are saying, well, why are we not doing that with our younger adults and people with physical health problems as well? So, um, very much support this and I think this is a work in progress and I really am I'm particularly looking forward to is seeing how these tests of change work and how we can roll them out and perhaps inform how we do things across NHS Tayside. 
particularly around the work in North West with the integrated teams and also the advanced nurse practitioners. So thank you very much, Bill, for your report and for all the work that you're doing. It's very, very much appreciated from uh, a GP perspective. Thanks for that, Alison. Um, Lois, did you want to come in? Yeah, thanks, Emma Jane. Um, yeah, just I welcome this report. Um, I think there's there's probably never been a more crucial time, although this work has been carried out already, Bill. I think we all know that right now, um, all of our mental health and well-being has been challenged and at greater risk. Um, so, you know, just to, to support the comments that have already been made, especially from Andy with regards to, to going into winter time um, and the impact that it may have. Um, I think we absolutely need to continue to, to break the stigma, stigma around mental health and that we, we work to build um, public trust and confidence again within our services. And, and hopefully those pathways can, you know, like, like as mentioned in the report, they need to be clear um, so that people know uh, how to access the right supports at the right time. Touching up just in terms of Hugh's point, um, I kind of support Hugh's concerns around the timing of the 20 service uh, and you know well you did well you did, you did. Um, but yeah i would like us to, to ensure that we can closely monitor that so that indeed you know we are uh, hitting our targets in times of time scales and also ensuring that you know should there be capacity within the north uh, that we would maybe be able to speed up that um that 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 support service for the, the south as well perhaps ahead of what has been scheduled. Um, but I guess my, my question is, is with regards, Phil, you touched on um, work that was being done across the board and in particular, and as well as with children's services. And I just wondered if you could expand a little bit more on that with regards to, to what work has been done, because we know that you know families will often be affected and it'll be more than one and that often children who do need mental health services um, We'll be looking to ensure that that pathway is clear as well, as especially during transition time. Yeah, so I can give one example of that. Um, so the mental health and wellbeing network, as you see, has representation from children's and, and adult services. And um, just in the last few months, Scottish government have released string fenced money to support um, young people, including counselling in schools. Perhaps in the past. You know, adult would have developed its peer support worker service for adults, children's services would have done it for children. The network has given us the opportunity to, to look at that together because although you have children and you've got adults, you've also got families, which, which are both. So we are having discussions to see, you know, for example, the peer support service, which is currently um, for people over 16. We are looking, is there a way that we can work together to make that much to cover the whole age span would be one example of that. And I'll give you one other quick example, our ADP, Alcohol and Drug Partnership, we commission services for young people, families and adults. Okay, thanks Bill. And just in terms of transition, I would imagine that similar works will be undertaken there to try and, I guess, bridge that gap for, for children transitioning into adult services so that as a smoother pathway as well? Yeah, we are, again, we're um, working with partners in community justice um, and, and George Bowie, with, George chairs a transitions group, and we are looking at how we can um, use some of this, this new funding that, that's coming through to, 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 to focus on transitions, because again, learning from um, adverse events, you know, young people in transition are a high risk vulnerable group and often find um, themselves um, in our services and we there's opportunities to, to give them a better experience, coordinate that better. So we are looking at um, how we can do that. Okay, thanks Bill. Thanks for that Bill. Um, I think we had one more question. Was it Catherine wanted to come in? Yes, thanks. I'll not take up um, too much more time. I was going to add um, the discussion about children's services in, but Bill has um, covered that, I think, sufficiently for the meeting. And the other thing was just a small point of accuracy. Um, I'm not, as far as I am aware, a representative on the Listen, Learn and Change um, strategic board, um, but I'm happy to, to be corrected about that. Okay, Catherine, I'll, I'll, I'll double check where I got that information and, and, and speak to you about that. 
Thanks very much. Okay. Well, thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. Understandably, lots of comments and questions, um, given um, mental health and mental health services are such an important issue for Angus, as well as all of the, the IJBs at the minute. So, so thanks very much to everybody for contributing to that. Um, are we all happy to note the content of that report? Yes. Okay, thanks very much. If we move on to uh, item agenda item number eight, which is the winter flu planning and COVID-19 update. Um, Gail, is this you that is uh, presenting this one? Um, I will start off, Chair, and then I'll hand over to Gillian Galloway um, okay. to speak particularly about the winter plan. But as you're all aware, and I think it's fair to say there are significant early warning signs coming now from our public health colleagues that we are in for a particularly challenging time ahead with the increase in COVID across Tayside. Um, initially, that was in Dundee. However, over the last week, we've seen an increase in both Perth and Kinross and areas of Angus. So suffice to say that locally, our own LRT group has been increased to twice a week and we will continue to manage um, any outbreaks as we previously done. We have got developed arrangements that we're ready to put in place and respond to any further outbreaks and increases in people testing positive. The challenge at the moment is regarding asymptomatic patients and um, there are a number of people presenting with no symptoms and only when they get their test results back we found they're positive. So there are increasing challenges there that we are required to manage locally. Um, as you're probably all aware there is a Scottish Government strategy and framework which is due to be published tomorrow and that will outline a tiered model so it's very much, will that tiered model be level three for Tayside as a whole or level three for Dundee and a different level for areas of Perth and Ross and Angus. So there are daily, sometimes twice daily conversations going on at the moment, Chair. So I think it's important to keep everybody abreast of this and it's changing, as we said, um, across the country on a day-to-day -day basis. Jill, can you, is Jill there? I can't actually see Jill. Jill, can yeah. you, yeah. yeah, on the paper, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Gail. Um, in terms of the, the paper, the, the paper you have in front of you is a combined update um, around winter planning and flu vaccination, as well as a COVID-19 update. Previously, we would have brought a separate paper around COVID, but due to the kind of integrated nature of that, along with our winter planning and flu vaccination, we felt it was appropriate to bring uh, a combined paper. So in terms of winter planning, included in the, the papers, you've got a copy of the um, NHS Tayside and Open Partnerships winter plan, which I understand is due to go to NHS Tayside board, um, I think, tomorrow for approval. So it's a, a draft report um, in terms of the paper that's come here and that's really as a result of timescales more than anything. As a partnership we've had um, good contribution to the development of that and I'd just like to draw your attention to um, the specific sections within the plan around um, Angus which details what we're going to do as a partnership um, to support and prepare for winter. Just a couple of other things to bring your attention to as the host partnership for primary care and out of hour services, um, both of which are critical when looking at planning um, and provision as a whole system 24 seven. And they've also got specific sections within the, the overall winter plan um, supporting primary care and out of hours. We're also working um, across the system around a, a joined up whole system alert um, trigger and escalation plan um, and all three partnerships are part of that discussion alongside primary care. I was going to give Elaine the offer of coming in, but she's currently <laughs> on the phone if she wanted to add anything around the, the winter planning discussions, but um, I think <laughs> there she is. Um, Elaine, I don't know if there's anything that you want to add. I was just saying how we've worked together to pull together the, the kind of winter plan, its whole system, 
and the, the kind of joined up approach to the alert and trigger an escalation plan. Well. Sorry, yeah, sorry, the, 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 the mental health stuff is still is, is, is live. Um, I, I think what I can say is the, the winter plan this year has been incredibly challenging, I think, because we've had to write the winter plan and the COVID plan in tandem. Um, and I think it is almost difficult to finish the winter plan because it is evolving. It's, it's impossible to, to finish a draft. Um, to assure, I think, that the, the IJB is that this is at the forefront of the whole of NHST side's thoughts. It is discussed at the Silver and Gold Commands. It is discussed at the Operational Executive Leadership Team. It's discussed at the board. Um, and I think it really is whole system working. Um, I think it will be an incredibly challenging winter. I think what we are seeing though is teams pulling together. There was some really good um, evidence today of, of delayed discharges. We've noticed they're going up, so we have to do something about it. So it's almost that that whole way of thinking just becoming ingrained. Um, I, I think there will be times that we will have great challenges in capacity and in different areas, um, but it's how we just work to meet that. And I think it will need constant initiative and agility. I think for our teams, I think we're seeing this year that we we know um, the effect of stepping services down. And I think I could get a sense from the teams just this week that that is incredibly difficult for, for clinicians and teams and management staff, everyone to hold, because they know that an Tended consequences this, as well as knowing that we have to care for people with COVID and with normal winter admissions. Um, you can see staff, everybody's getting their flu jab, everybody is trying to keep going, um, but I think it is going to be a winter like no other. I think our mental health um, need will continue to go up. I think we have some areas of almost a doubling of referrals, um, and that's going to be a real challenge. But um, I, I think we're getting, we're as good as we can be, um, and I think things like near patient testing, flu testing, vaccine rates, I really think we're going to see Tayside being at the cutting edge of lots of these things. Um, and the team working really hard to do it, but it is going to be a constant, constant challenge. Um, I think we've got a lot of the communication. There was a great, there was a primary care Zoom starting with Alison, Alison, I think. We're, we're kind of trying to communicate. A lot of secondary care clinicians joined those and it was brilliant. Um, and I get a sense everybody's doing it with good humour, but the challenge is definitely there and, and hats off. I'm not writing the winter plan this year. I've, I've passed it on to David Connell, but I think the team need a, a massive thanks for doing it for all of us. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you. In, in terms of um, moving on, Elaine's obviously alluded to the, the kind of parallel planning around winter and COVID and Gail's given a, a bit of a position statement around where we currently are. And I think just noting that the, the changes um, since writing the report and where we are now with the numbers um, around COVID is quite significant um, and Tayside have seen quite a significant increase in positive um, cases and with the, the level of spread as well, um, which Gail's articulated in terms of Dundee having a, a higher R number than um, certainly within Angus. Sorry, the, the numbers are um, going up and we need to consider how we acknowledge that um, and the number of the people that are asymptomatic and still continue to pass um, the virus on. And the remobilisation plan that we presented at the last um, IGB, we continue to progress with this. However, I think in light of the, the numbers, we see ourselves in that drifting back into the, the mobilisation and, and escalation um, stages again. I think specific to Angus and COVID, um, we continue to work well um, and provide safe care across um, the whole population and all of our services, working along with key partners. Um, and in that I include population and um, carers as well, and the, the private providers. And obviously I've been sitting there, who are absolutely key um, in everything that, that we do in that kind of approach of being together and working together to, to face this um, head on is really important. There are a couple of things just in terms of the mode of trans transmission um, around COVID and as part of our response um, to this wave, we're currently reviewing our business continuity plans again um, and our capacity both in terms of inpatients and community. And that includes the configuration of services 
to make sure that we can continue to provide safe, the safest care possible in the most appropriate environments for both patients um, and staff. Just in terms of the, the flu vaccination, um, I have to pass thanks on to Rona, who's done a sterling job in Angus around that and just pass over to Rona um, now to discuss the, the flu um, vaccination and then I'll just sum up at the end, Chair, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everybody. Um, the, the, there is a summary included within your paper uh, with regards to the planning around um, flu vaccine delivery. This is coordinated regionally um, by public health and um, with input from ourselves and operationally led by ourselves within our respective areas. Um, vaccine, vaccination has actually gone well and um, we're on target to complete the care homes tomorrow. Um, which will be all the staff and patients vaccinated within a month, which is is, is unprecedented, I think. Um, so, I mean, a huge debt of gratitude to our district nursing colleagues who really have um, delivered the goods for us within a very short time frame to get, get that programme delivered to our highest risk population. Um, not really anything major to, to report. Um, we have run a combined approach this year whereby general practices have delivered flu clinics, but we've provided additional staffing to them where that's been requested or required. Um, and we've also supplemented that with um, locality clinics running within outpatient services for the adult um, vaccination programme. So um, it, it's been a lot of work. Um, it's not done yet, um, but we're definitely on target. And um, there's a regional TVAC group meets every week um, to keep an eye on the ball and to make sure that we deal in a prompt fashion with um, any changes. And this is a very, very um, mobile um, environment. Things are changing all the time um, and making sure that we've got the right vaccines in the right places for the right category of patient. Um, national campaigns we're a little bit later in starting this year, um, and, I, and I think that has added to some confusion from for the public with regards to communications about eligibility. But I'm pleased to say that um, thank, following local um, communications, we have um, had really good feedback from, from patients about how they found the service to be um, this winter. I know a lot of people have anxieties around attending health centres at the moment um, due to the COVID risks, um, but very, very positive feedback pretty much across the board um, for all sites um, for the help given. I should also just add a final thank you the Voluntary Action Angus, who have provided a, a wide number of volunteers across Angus to help us marshal in these clinics, and that has definitely contributed to how smooth um, they have run on the day. And, and I think we, I would very much welcome that being kind of noted. Thank you, Rona. Um, I think just part of what Rona's described, and obviously Elaine and myself from a winter planning perspective, demonstrates the, the kind of whole system and the joined up working. And I have to ask Alison and David if there's anything that they want to add, because I think part of the, the reason that we have been successful in Angus is because of the way that we've joined up um, working across everywhere. Um, so I don't know if Alison or David want to, to raise anything specifically around primary care. Just from an Angus perspective around primary care, I think we have got the right relationships and the right structures and I think we were able to devolve leadership to local teams and allow them to get on with it. So I think, you know, we, we allow that through some of our models of care and we have integrated teams in the ground and I think that has stood us in excellent stead. And I would reiterate what uh, Rona said about our district nurses and the work that they've done about flu vaccinations, but also uh, supporting the care homes at this time. We're all working together. And I think that is, it, it just shows you that if you get that sort of model of care right, uh, when things are getting difficult, we all pull together in our teams. And I just uh, hope that we can continue that this winter. I'm sure we will do our best. Thank you, Alison. And can't forget the, the input and the, the support that we've had from the, the social care staff as well, um, working to support the delayed discharges as well as a significant increase in provision of care at home um, as well. I think just to, to reiterate and kind of pull it together, the, the commitment of all of the staff working across the whole system to meet the needs of the population. And I think we'll have to, to thank them for that and thanks to the IJB as well for their continued support. Um, over what has been an extremely busy and what will be um, a busier and more challenging time ahead. 
um, and as a as a leadership team and as um, an IGB, I'm sure we will continue to support and look after our staff, um, our patients as well as we can and each other um, so that we can provide the best care for the population of, of Angus. Happy to take any questions, Chair. Okay, thank, thanks very much for that. Um, that was really helpful. Um, although obviously challenging times a, a ahead, I think there's been quite a bit of assurance provided there with regard to readiness, especially with regard to, to winter planning. Um, I, just before I open it up to questions, um, I had just one question or, or one issue, one comment. Um, is around staff resilience, and you know maybe maybe a few few of you can maybe answer this. You know, in terms of staff resilience, this has been a long year for staff already, and they're now looking down the barrel of a very long winter. You know, what is in place to, in terms of mental health and well-being for our staff? And um, many of them maybe won't have been able to take much annual leave up to now. Um, so it would be interesting to hear, um, maybe not just from one of you, from a few of you, with regard to your views on staff resilience. Thanks. Um, Chair, I think this is something that we've discussed over the last few weeks at our team meetings, um, as well as our um, kind of response leadership meetings as well, because what I think we saw is over the, the summer period, people did take some annual leave and feel refreshed, but um, the longevity of that wasn't great. And people, again, already are becoming quite tired. Um, and actually the level of anxiety among staff is increasing as well because we really just don't know what, what to expect. So in terms of um, support for them, and Bill and Gail and George, um, I'm sure will we'll come in. We continue to provide the, the RRR rooms um, within our area so that staff have access to that. Um, we have introduced some additional support through our team meetings, um, just given the opportunity for staff and teams to, to actually say how they're feeling. Um, so just to give an example of that, we've used something called Spaces for Listening um, within one of our team meetings where staff were just given the opportunity to say how they were feeling um, and people actually actively listen and support people um, around that. Bill, um, I know you've been doing a bit of work from a, a health and wellbeing perspective, so I don't know if you want to come in around that as well. Yeah, I mean, I think there are there are two things I'd want to say is that just to pick up on the point about annual leave, um, I think as a management team, we really are encouraging our staff to take annual leave. Often staff don't want to take it because they feel there's nothing they can do, but we understand that, you know, you need to have that week off, that two week off to recharge your batteries. So we're actively encouraging annual leave and we're discouraging carrying forward of annual leave. Um, NHS Tayside Psychology Department have been given additional resource to support all health and social care staff. So previously it was just employees of NHS Tayside. Um, however, they've now been given central government funding to extend that. And um, it's still very early days yet. And we have um, communication with Alison Rollins from psychology as to what that support would look like. But it is identifying um, that, you know, it is more than just the NHS staff that need that need this support. Okay, thank, thanks very much for that. Um, do we have uh, any other questions or comments? I see Gail um, and Chris and Peter. Gail, do you want to come in first? Sorry, Chair, I couldn't see if my hand was up there. Um, in response to, to Rona, first of all, I would also like to thank Rona and to Karen Fletcher and also the senior the senior district nurses alongside BA and social care and everyone else, because this is no mean feat. Please don't underestimate the level of work and activity that's gone in to provide this effective delivery of the flu vaccination programmes. This has involved an immense amount of work, and that includes general practice and how they've had to reorganise their care, because absolutely there's been an increased requirement for this but there hasn't been that increased resource to support that. So everybody's gone above and beyond there. I've actually taken huge confidence um, from my senior team and direct reports with how they're handling the outbreak management and how they're supporting their team. And they're each daily providing different opportunities to support their staff. However, the Pulse Survey 
the results do say that we can do more to value our staff and how, how else we can support them. So we're really trying to find out what else people would like by way of support, because you're absolutely right. It's unprecedented times and we really do need to value and support your staff. So thank you very much as an IGB for doing that. And Karen, I would like perhaps for that to be in the minute so that we can share that on behalf of yourselves. I think that would be appreciated. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Gail. Um, Chris? Thanks, Chair. I just wanted to uh, sort of come in just with a couple of, uh, of items. I know what Bill had said earlier on about annual leave, I mean, across the, the, the local authority, we have certainly been encouraging our members to take annual leave as well, despite that situation that Bill described, where well, I can't actually go anywhere uh, or do anything, it's taking that time away from work that is critically important. And we are extremely supportive and actually encourage our members to take that annual leave, albeit, I mean, there are edicts out there that actually explain and describe how much leave should be taken proportionately as the leave year moves on. So, you know, we totally support our, our, our members getting time away uh, from the front line, and that's indeed where they've worked. And, you know, when we look at some of our social care staff that are employed by the authority, they've been at the front line of the, of the pandemic, along with their NHS colleagues, really since, since, since day one uh, of all this, working constantly, working long shifts, picking up extra shifts, uh, you know, with, with an element of the workforce, have, um, isolating from, from time to time. So the pressure has really been on them, and, you know, and, and that needs to be recorded and, and, and recognised uh, by the board, which I'm glad to hear that that's, that's actually uh, happening today. Uh, we'd explored through, just also to say as well, and explored through the last staff forum. It's the first I'd heard about these the kind of restrooms that were available certainly on NHS sites uh, for staff. And I know that's something we're perhaps going to explore through staff forum for uh, local authority, uh, frontline care staff as well, uh, to see what we can provide for them in terms of provision of a, of a kind of breakout area in the, in the way that you described. So I'd look forward to, to pursuing that through uh, the staff forum but yeah i mean in terms of recognition of what our members are doing i mean it's sterling sterling work and i'm certainly very very proud of it thanks thanks for that chris um and peter yeah thank you chair um sort of working back from the comments um yeah i agree with chris um that the staff need a break i also think that it's worthwhile pointing out that some of the management needs a break as well um, they've had a horrendous couple of a horrendous year, and I think we ought to recognise that. You know, they've turned up to these meetings. They're planning day in, day out, night in, night out. So I think we should recognise the fact that the amount of work that's been done by them as well. I'd like that minuted too. Um, coming back to Rona's point. Um, I have nothing but praise from what I've seen for the flu vaccination program so far, just as, a, as a, an oldie who's been vaccinated. Um, it was incredibly efficient um, in Southwest Angus, and I hope it was in the, the rest of Angus. It seems to be a lot more efficient than other um, Tayside uh, IJBs, that's for sure. So yeah, we, I think everybody appreciates that, although they may not say it. Um, I'd like to turn to the report itself, the Tayside report. Um, for uh, the winter plan and it's point eight on page 93 and it says mental health and learning disability as the headline and then there's a page on mental health and no further mention of um, of learning disabilities it's got to say it'd be the same as it was before I'm concerned and disappointed about that because um, we've got people with learning disabilities, people with physical disabilities and carers of those people who are vulnerable. Um, the carers have to go out to get supplies, essential supplies, and the people themselves are, are, are vulnerable uh, both physically um, to COVID and also to the mental health issues because there are still uh, very few, if any, uh, resources for them to take advantage of. So, as I say, I'd like to register my disappointment. It may be a bit too late, but I think it's something that should be considered uh, in, in coming years. Okay, thank, thank you for those comments, Peter. Um, I see George is waving his hand. He maybe wants to respond uh, to that. Yeah. <laughs> if I can. Thanks, first of all, Peter. Appreciate your um, positive comments about uh, the, the management contribution as well. Um, you know, we're not quite in the front line, but uh, 
Uh, nonetheless, it's been pretty grueling, I think, all around. Um, to appreciate your, your remarks, thank you. Yeah, I think very often uh, learning disability um, gets referred to in the same breath as, as mental health, because sometimes traditionally those things have been coupled together uh, for strategic planning purposes. And I, uh, you know my views on that, I, they are not the same thing. Uh, but I, I, just to give you reassurance, uh, we will always have people like myself advocating for the, the learning disability and physical disability client group. And Linda Kennedy's on the call today, the service leader. So uh, just to reassure you that we will always be considering things from those angles. Good, thank you. Okay, um, do we have any other uh, questions before I move on to the recommendations for this paper? I see a lot of hands waving at me now. <laughs> um, I'm just well, trying to- Councillor Bell and Councillor Miles and Gail. Who, who was that? Sorry, Karen, I didn't- okay. Councillor Bell and Councillor Miles and Gail Smith. Okay, thanks. If we take Councillor Bell first then. Thank you very much. And uh, believe me, I, I know the hard way how much work goes into these plans, um, having been involved with them in a previous life. Um, and and they, they feel really comforting. So a, a couple of things for me, um, Jill touched on it around um, the population. And I'm, I'm curious to know if there was any sort of modeling that you could apply in terms of compliance around the, the national guidance and the, and the different tiers approach um, when we were coming up with what was required, if, if you like, um, was it 80% compliance? Was it 60, 40? Um, because I think that's a big thing that the public can do to help our services um, to, to, stick, to stick to the rules and to protect not just themselves and their loved ones, but the services for those who really need them. And again, picking up on um, something that uh, perhaps Peter said, actually, at what point might we need to trigger the heart model again? Uh, and is, is that is that all in place? Because as a, as a member of the Public Health Scotland board, um, I know that the conversations there, uh, th this is a, an incredibly anxious time. Um, and I know personally that my anxiety levels have gone through the roof, you know, taking on board the, the winter planning, flu, potentially COVID vaccination programmes, people's trust in, in all of that and the uptake um, that might impact on us further down the road. So um, can anyone provide any insight into that, please? Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to respond, um, Councillor Bell. So in terms of modelling, it's been a, a bit of a challenge for us in terms of modelling from a community perspective. So a lot of the modelling for COVID has been in relation to inpatients. Um, and the inpatient activity in terms of hospitalised cases and ICU cases. Um, what we haven't been able to do, albeit I know the Scottish Government and Public Health Scotland are working extremely hard around um, modelling in terms of numbers from a, a community um, perspective. What we don't have is, in is, is data around compliance. That's, that's very difficult in terms of population compliance against the, the restrictions. That's why, um, and I know we've got comms and engagement on the, the agenda for today, communication with the population of Angus is critical um, in terms of how we communicate with the population and make sure that they are aware of their, I'm going to say responsibilities because we've all got responsibility around the, the restrictions um, and what we do on a, an individual or a, a household or a family level may not impact on us directly, but actually it might have quite a significant impact on somebody who we interact with. Um, so the, the comms part of that for us um, is, is really important. In terms of your question around the, the trigger points, um, and you gave Hart as, as an example, um, I'll just I'll answer that from two different perspectives, if, if that's okay, um, Councillor Bell. So the work that we're doing whole system is tight to look at tr trigger points across the whole system. Um, for what may need to be triggered when. Um, and the, the heart um, side of things is picked up through the, 
the IMT meetings with the council and George, I'm, I'm pretty sure that I, if I was to say that that's all in place and ready to, to press the button as and when um, required, then that, that would be and is regularly discussed and George attends the, the council IMT, which their frequency has increased as has the NHS Tayside Silver um, kind of response meetings have increased as well as of next Monday. Um, so triggers are, are a huge part of that so that we can press the button when we need to um, as soon as we, we can. George will probably want to come in specifically. Yeah, if I can. Sorry, Chair, I can't find a way of putting a, a hand up other than my actual hand and just waving it about, so my apologies. So we wouldn't worry about it, everybody's just using their actual hands. So. Yeah. yeah, Heart has recommenced. Um, it's now going to be called ARC, however, which is Angus' response to COVID. Um, I was informed at the meeting earlier in the week that um, the shielding people on the shielding list, the previous shielding list, uh, will all be receiving letters about the five protection levels and also including the letters additional advice uh, around work, school, shopping uh, and contact with other people uh, and also advice about accessing free supplies of vitamin D. Uh, so yes, um, uh, Heart's back in a slightly different form and it, it was described like many other things as it's beginning to ramp up. Does that answer your questions? Yep. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, I've got Councillor Miles and Gail. Yes, uh, th thank you, Chair. Well, I'd like to start by, by uh, th thanking very much Gail, Gillian and their teams for a very comprehensive report. Uh, I know an awful lot of work's gone into this report and it, it uh, shows uh, and it seems to cover all bases. And also e echo sentiments uh, uh, said by, by Peter and, and uh, also uh, Ron and Alison on how well the flu vaccination program's gone. In the Northeast, uh, I went along the clinic and it just ran like clockwork, very, very smoothly and no problem. Uh, I just hope we don't have any uh, supply problems. I believe some other health boards have had supply problems in Scotland, but uh, as far as I know, I guess in, in uh, Tayside haven't had any vaccine supply problems. Slightly concerned a comment by, by uh, Gillian on uh, some coming back with asymptomatic uh, test results. Uh, if this is coming back in some of the COVID, it could create problems. So I'd just like to know a little more about that, please. Thank you. Problem. So I, I think Gail touched on it as well, Councillor Miles. I think one of the challenges are that people actually are not realising that they have COVID. Um, so they're, they're asymptomatic and that they don't have any specific symptoms of um, COVID and if they are tested for whatever reason and that test comes back positive, um, they haven't obviously been able to self-isolate because they don't specifically have any symptoms um, and that's where obviously the test and protect, um, test and trace kicks in around that and identifying the, the contacts. The other challenge that, that we have had um, is around the, the process for testing patients in hospital pre-transfer and um, also coming back and um, they had they are asymptomatic and that they don't have any symptoms um, and then unfortunately due to the incubation period post-transfer they have developed symptoms albeit they've had a negative test and um, so that is, is something else that we are seeing um, increasing. Would, would that lead to an incubation period when they're transferred then? Would that be so what, what we are, yeah, so thank you. Um, what we are looking to do within Angus is um, have an isolation period within our community hospitals. So if an individual is either um, admitted from the community or transferred from um, another hospital setting, then we would look to have an isolation period um, for that individual coming into the, that environment. Okay, thank you. The test result. Um, thank you. Okay, I had Gail and I've also seen Rona's hand up um, and then um, we can work through the recommendations. Yeah, um, um, Councillor Miles, just by way of reassurance, there is guidance for step down of COVID positive patients. So there is guidance available there. The other thing I should have mentioned is there has been a COVID-19 vaccination programme board established and chaired by Dr Emma Fletcher 
The first meeting was held yesterday. So just to confirm that as well. And Peter, can I ask again, which page number were you referring to in the winter plan? You're on mute, Peter. You're on mute. <laughs> right. Um, yeah, it was the bottom of page 93, section 93. 8, and then all of page 94. Okay, thank you. Elaine, can I confirm, will you be in attendance at the NHS board for this item tomorrow? No, I'm wondering. Oh, no, it'll be David, David Connell. David Connell is the okay. author of the board. So I think, I think Dave Connell is presenting. I just wonder if we could draw his attention to that tonight. I will do so. Dave Connell um, and uh, Susan Bean. Yeah, I'll go and try and. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, and then I had Rona's hand up. Thank you. I just wanted to address Councillor Miles' um, inquiry about vaccine supply. Um, at the start of this journey, a decision was made to go to weekly distribution of vaccines. Normally, we have a bulk order goes out to each of our sites. Um, and obviously, the risk around that is you potentially end up with vaccines sitting in the wrong place. Um, what we have had is a weekly ordering process and we've got a weekly feedback from practices and all our clinic sites around the numbers vaccinated and the numbers planned for the following week, which allows us to keep a very tight handle on the, you know, the vaccine supply that we have available to us. So at the moment we're managing um, and, and obviously we have seen the, the increased uptake that we anticipated across all, all groups of patients this year and staff, so um, which we welcome. Um, but uh, just to give you the reassurance that at the moment largely due to a lot of work on the vaccine supply services um, front and NHS T side, um, it's making sure that the vaccines are in the right place for the clinics. Well, well done. Pass on our thanks to all involved with that, Rona, please. Thanks. Thank you very much for that. Um, so we're, as a, the IJB is being recommended um, that we approve and endorse the winter plan um, for submission to the Scottish Government and then that we note um, the various issues under the recommendations here, the cost pressures, the whole system working, and the approach taken within Angus to support flu vaccine and the COVID-19 update. So are we all happy to uh, note and approve those items? Chair, sorry, um, Councillor Speed was wanting to... Oh, oh, apologies, I didn't see comment. that. It, it, it's okay, can you hear me? I would have just uh, let it go, but Sorry. It, was, it was just really a, a quick one, um, picking up on um, the, the response to our COVID response during the winter, um, and the heart is changing to, I think, ARC, which is Angus' response to COVID, is that right? Thank yeah, that's right. Yeah is, that, yeah, is that right, George? And it was just to say, I think... Um, we need to be really clear in our communication then so that there's no confusion. Um, is those contact details going to be the same for people as they were before? Um, I'm just thinking around those that might not be on necessarily who were, who were in the shielding list and that will receive a letter. There may be other vulnerable people out there who would will need some support, especially um, if they're challenged by the weather or mobility. Um, and so just, yeah, just want to really kind of just highlight and um, we need to be sure that we send out clear communication um, and also uh, taking into account those that might not be digitally connected as well. Very good point, absolutely. Oh, yeah, sure, Lois, to take those points. Uh, Fiona Rennie's on that group actually, uh, and she is on the call, she might want to comment, but I think uh, generally speaking, those are all valid points. We would want to make sure that was, that was taken on board, especially that kind of adapt, adaptability that we're going to need to have. Yeah. yeah. OK, thank you. Elaine, you had your you were waving your hand there. Yes, yeah, so it was just an update about the shielding. Um, I think we anticipated that there may be a shielding may be used in some other way during the year. So we've actually updated all since April. Um, the, we've kept the list very relevant. We've kept it up to date. We've worked with local authorities, so addresses are correct. We've taken people off and on the list. Um, and I think we've also been very aware with clinicians that to keep reminding people that as they're consenting people, that, that it may have an impact through the winter. Um, I think we've had some really good working across local authority. I've always said I've worked with local authorities, but I didn't really. I've worked with health and social care partnerships before, but this time I did actually work with the local authority and with councils. Um, but I think it would be a very uncertain time for 
um, people who are shielding. I think the instruction will come if we go do go into one of the higher tiers to work from home and also about social distancing. And I think that will be psychologically a massive hit on many of our shielding people. Um, we had a great snapshot of staff, about half of our shielding staff were, you know, were, were actually in, in very patient facing jobs. And we had a lot of people who were active clinicians and, and patient facing people who were asked to shield. So it's not just something of an older age group, it's sometimes very young, economically active people. And it was devastating to being asked to step away from, from your clinical job. So I think we've, we've tried to keep those lines of communication open, um, but yeah, it, it's going to be a hard winter for many people. Thanks, Elaine. Thanks, thanks very much for that, Elaine. Um, moving on now to um, agenda item number nine. Um, this is the Angus Primary Care update on premises. Um, we uh, are being asked to note the contents of the report. We've all read the report in advance. Um, I'm not sure who's presenting this report, but um, is it Gail, is it you? Um, can you ask Rona Gill to run us on the call, Chair? Yeah. Thank you. If you'd like to highlight some of the um, important issues for the IGB members, that would be very helpful, thanks. And then we can take some questions at the end if we have any. Thanks, Chair. Um, so this paper we agreed I would bring to the table um, following on the Primary Care Improvement Plan update report at the last meeting. Um, the, as you know, PSIP uh, and all things related are um, introduced as a means of improving GP and general practice sustainability. Um, the, the current challenges around sustainability within general practice are, are well documented, and in particular the, the medical workforce and recruitment issues. Um, this paper outlines, it, it focuses in the first instance on GP premises. There's a much bigger piece of work around primary care premises more broadly. Um, and in particular, the National Code of Practice for GP premises, which was seen as an enabler um, when the primary care improvement plan and GMS contract was launched back in 2018. Um, we know that for many GPs, um, for young GPs, the prospect of kind of buying into a partnership as would have happened at one time, um, including the responsibilities around premises and owning a premise is one of the, the issues that makes general practice a less attractive option. Um, so this government strategy, it's a 25 year plan. So, I mean, I guess that's one of the challenges because it lays out a vision that's going to take us quite some time to deliver. Um, and there are clear timelines um, along the way with that. Um, but really it's, it's trying to create a landscape whereby GPs are no longer expected to own their own premise. And, and, and really that is the philosophy within 25 years time. Obviously they could do it if they chose to, but there won't be a requirement for them to do that. And the code sets out a number of actions as I've outlined in the paper um, in terms of how we will get there the issues that need to be addressed. It's very complex, both from a legal perspective as well as a, as a, as a premises and buildings perspective. For us, um, one of the reasons we really wanted to bring this to the table um, was one to highlight the responsibilities of health boards and partnerships as outlined in the national strategy. I think it's useful for the IGB to be aware of that at this time. Um, we have already highlighted in, in a number of earlier papers the current challenges around the changing landscape of primary care and health and social care partnership services and utilising the resources we currently have available to us with regards premises, the state of the premise um, in, in some instances. Um, and obviously COVID has changed the landscape again with a, an acceleration around our use of digital health um, and what will normal look like in a year's time. You know, some of that is unknown at this moment in time. I've outlined within the paper the infrastructure in terms uh, of how we plan for premises moving forward and I guess I've given you a reassurance that at this stage we planned for the PSIP on the basis of minimal um, investment in premises because historically there hasn't been a huge amount of investment in primary care premises so we, we, we couldn't afford to take the risk of making any of our plans dependent on, on the realisation of premises plans. I've included a table that gives you just a general overview of the current state with regards to our practices, you know, who owns what, um, so you get a feel for the enormity of the challenge that lies ahead for us. Um, of course, within um, Angus, there's the ad other added complication of the local development plan and where um, significant housing um, is proposed and planned and how that aligns to our healthcare services and what consideration is currently given to um, health services ability to cope um, with such services as they come in. 
Um, there's a number of other issues I've raised in the paper about particular requirements. So, for example, if a practice is a training practice, we know we need there is room requirements quite clearly stated. You can only be a training practice if you can give your, your staff room space. Um, and we know that by um, continuing to support practices as training practices, that's good for our further recruitment and retention work work plan. So it, it's meant to be a, a kind of a current state document and an overview of the challenges that lies ahead and the, the processes that we're putting in place to start that journey. Um, we have benefited um, over the last couple of years, this is our second year, from some health and social care partnership resources to support some of the immediate solutions. So for example, where we need to strip out a carpet and turn a room in a practice into a clinical area, we can do so. Um, it's that kind of level of work we can do ourselves. And that has greatly assisted us um, in these two years. Um, the rest of the capital resource sits at board level. Um, our major concern at the moment, as you're aware, um, is Ravenswood surgery, um, and we are working with both NHS Tayside and Scottish Government now to try and find a solution um, for Ravenswood premises moving forward. Okay, uh, thanks very much, Luna. Um, I, I certainly found it very interesting, very informative, um, especially a kind of the, the horizon scan, you know, issues are seen to be very highly likely to arise and therefore pushing up the priority list. So thank you. For that. Um, we have a question. I see Gail, are you, are you? No, you're not. <laughs> Has anybody else uh, got any questions or comments for Rona? No? Okay, well, we're being asked to note the contents of that report for information. So thank you very much, Rona. Uh, moving on to uh, agenda item uh, 10, is the physical disability priority improvements. Um, let's see. George, is this? Yes, George will do this and he's supported by Linda Kennedy and Fiona Rennie today, Chair. Okay, um, so we uh, as a board are being asked to approve um, the, the improvement plan for public consultation to note the current priorities and to request a further progress report in February 2021 uh, following public consultation and the development of the action plan. Uh, so I'll hand over to George now. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Yes, I, I'm invited Linda and Fiona to attend and uh, my appreciation to them for all the work they've done in the improvement plan. And uh, what I'll do is I'll kind of summarise the main points and Fiona and uh, Linda will probably be able to contribute to the more detailed uh, questions. So uh, members will remember that we established a, a separate physical disability service some time ago, really because we thought that that uh, client group was not receiving sufficient attention with the previous arrangement, which was that it, it was included in older people's services and many of the service users were much younger. Um, we wanted to um, strengthen our focus on this client group uh, and indeed improve our ability to, to meet their needs. So this is a long and, and pretty detailed but very uh, thorough report and I'll, I'll try and summarise it, which might be tricky. Um, so what we wanted to do was take the, the same approach as the kind of tried and tested one we had used for learning disability services. We, we thought, thought that worked quite well. Uh, this report we would have hoped to bring in August, so apologies, it's a bit late, uh, and that's entirely down to kind of disruption to the planned work due to COVID. Um, our, our key driver, the bottom of, of, of the page there, is to shift the balance of care to support more people in our communities and support people to greater independence for longer. That's in the, the strategic plan, and that informs really all of our efforts that I'm going to describe. So the plan includes... Um, all internally and externally provided services within the Adult Physical Disability Service, as well as a, a review of our processes, our procedures, pathways, and functions relating to the provision of health and so, social care across the PD service. We, we had hoped to recruit a planning officer to, to drive this work forward, uh, so that we'd be a bit further on, but that's all also been delayed by COVID, but is now underway. Uh, section six uh, talks about our priority areas. Uh, the first of those to highlight uh, is the demographic uh, pressures that are on the, the service, just in terms of, of growth of business, but also the, the changes in complexity uh, of, of need 
in the service user group. Uh, one of our tasks is to review uh, the existing uh, care packages and in particular to look at the out of area uh, uh, placements to see if uh, repatriation is possible. Now that's desirable for a, a whole range of region, reasons, but in particular, it's difficult to support out of area placement and people are often at great distance uh, from their, their family members and loved ones. Uh, there is also a cost element to that. We, we, we sometimes believe, not in every instance, but we sometimes believe that we can do things better and cheaper closer to home. Um, you can see uh, in, in page, uh, on page 117, about halfway down the page, table three, which reflects the increase uh, in personal care hours that the, the service uh, has, has encountered. Uh, quick comment about uh, delayed discharges. Um, we've heard comments er earlier in this meeting about delayed discharges. We, we want to improve our range of services for under 65s. We feel that too often um, in the, the, the right, if you like, need to get people out of hospital, we're having to uh, accommodate people who are under 65 in facilities that are for much older uh, service users and that isn't appropriate and doesn't particularly meet their needs. So we want to, to improve our range of options uh, and that will include uh, respite care for under 65s. Uh, overall, uh, page uh, 119 uh, it, it notes that we wish to um, develop our uh, supported accommodation uh, for, for people with physical disabilities, but uh, in particular, a respite accommodation. Section 6.5 uh, summarises issues in relation to daycare and the need for daycare provision for people with physical disability to be uh, reviewed. And section six highlights the need for more effective access to health services for people with physical disabilities uh, who often have a whole range of complex needs. Uh, finally, there you can see on page 122 uh, the financial implications of our plan um, and the balance between our, our cost pressures and our saving measures. And you can see there that we have a projected shortfall of £425,000, um, which we need to, to work on bridging. Sandy might want to comment on that at, at some point. So within that, that's a very short summary of a very complex uh, report, but very happy to, to, to take questions, Chair, or you might want to, to ask if, if Fiona or Linda would like to uh, add anything to what I've said. Um, thank you very much for that, George. Um, I think if we have any questions, maybe um, they could come in as well. Um, if people have got any specific questions, do we have any questions? I see uh, Sandy and Peter. Yeah, thank, thanks, Chair. I'll maybe just pick up on that last section that George was speaking about, uh, given he's just mentioned it on page 122. Um, so we have, uh, this is one of the planned interventions I mentioned earlier on in uh, under the finance section, where we know at, at a high level, we have got behind with our kind of you know, sense of where we wanted to be by this by this time, uh, largely due to COVID, but, but also for some other reasons that are more operational. Um, the, the, the narrative under that table kind of highlights that um, information such as is included in that table will eventually appear in our financial plans and hopefully uh, most board members would recognize that pattern from previous years where we have um, papers that gradually come together to form an overall plan for example the, the PD pro, uh, paper we've got here the, the LD one which is the next one or various other papers but it, it is important as George has flagged up you know, to note that this one does have a gap in it and we've got uh, an improvement plan kind of coming through coming together and if we are able to kind of generate uh, more ideas and more, you know, more uh, scope for savings or closing out that gap, that is one of the things that will help our overall financial plan to balance when we start to see that coming together at future IGB me meetings. So it's helpful for George to say that for this paper. I'm not, I'm not saying the same thing for the, uh, the next paper on the agenda, the LD1, but it applies equally to that and, and any similar types of papers that we see. Thank you. Thanks for that, Sandy. That's very helpful. 
Um, Peter, did you want to come in with a question? Yeah, thanks, Emma. Um, just don't mute yourself, Sandy, because I've got a comment for you. I've actually got three comments. Um, the first one is on page 115.3, um, um, the final paragraph. It says, uh, when it talks about overspend, there are underlying weaknesses in our PD financial reporting. Um, I'd like some more detail on that. And also whether those weaknesses mean that um, this reflects back on the, the earlier discussion we had about um, support from other partners. And also whether that means the underlying weaknesses, whether that means the reporting is inaccurate and whether we really do have that overspend or is it more than that or is it less than that? That's the first point. Okay, I, I can answer that. Uh, Peter, one of the, the challenges we're having with our uh, physical disabilities financial reporting is our ability to extract all of the service elements and their costs from the previous arrangement with uh, older people services. So many of the budgets were included as part of the older people services, and we have to take a proportion of that out and into the physical right. disability service. So it's just a work in progress. It's not that the work's inaccurate, but it's just that we need to, over time, gradually move all those resources across, across the budget as following the services, if you like. And some of the costs that we incur in commissioning services and so on, it's not quite so easy to separate them all out as it sounds. So we're just working on all of that. So that's that's the, the fundamental issue that we're, we're struggling with, but get, we're getting there. Okay, thank you. That That's the first one. The second one, uh, again, is at 6.3 on the report. And it says uh, at the penultimate sentence or the last sentence on the first paragraph says, we aim to ensure that care is more consistently supported. Um, that seems a bit soft and woolly to me. Um, you know, that's a maybe possibly, you know, it would be nice if we could sort of thing. And I think that I would be much happier if that were down in the um, improvement areas uh, as, as one of the improvement areas. And coming down to that area, if we really are um, determined to get these things improved, I know this is a long-term report, this is a three-year report, um, but I would like to see timescales and priorities. We're not going to be able to do all of them all at the same time in the first year. So when are we going to do each one um, and, and how are we going to prioritise them? Yeah, okay, Peter. Um... Fair points. Uh, I would say our commitment to uh, improving the situation for carers is an absolute. The, 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 the wording should not be interpreted as there being any kind of willingness or ambivalence about that. Probably, I was very conscious, you know, that, that we have lots of other reports that we bring about the carer's strategy, so I didn't really want to labour that point because we report it elsewhere, but please be assured that we see that as a real high priority. Now, in terms of prioritisation, you know, we were behind with the report um, because of COVID. We wanted to get it onto the table and seek approval for next steps, but we will come back with much clearer prioritisation of what we would want to do in year one, year two and year three. So that, that would be next steps, really. We do want, of course, to have the consultation with people, uh, and you know that's attached on the back the, the, the plan. But um, that that might give us a bit of a steer about what we do in year one and two and three from that exercise. So we don't want to be too firm about it yet. I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's good. Got any more questions? I've got uh, Councillor Bell and Sandy. Sandy, did you want to reply to that last point first and then we'll take... Yeah, um... please. Yeah, th thanks uh, for Peter for the question and thanks George for, for the reply. And George is absolutely right. We flagged this up before we are teasing and we're in a, a process of effectively kind of re-delineating a new service uh, in terms of giving PD uh, physical disability its own profile. And it's easy to forget that, that, you know, if you wind the clock back two years ago, we didn't have this discrete... Uh, resource it was it was all embedded in other things uh, but I, I would say our ability to do that as quickly as I would have liked and uh, has probably been um, held back a bit by our ability to, to access uh, the right kind of capacity in the system so George is right in terms of the reason why it's proved quite complicated in terms of teasing something out but also we could probably have done this quicker and better if we'd had all the resources available to us to, to allow us to do that and I do regularly in financial reports flag up that we sometimes struggle with the, the finance capacities that we have. I think that's probably one of the things that Peter is alluding to, because that's popped up occasionally in, 
in this forum, but also in the audit committee. So you're right, Peter, that, that it is symptomatic of an issue you, you've been cited on before, and the specific circumstances regarding this are, are, are caused by the circumstances that, that George highlighted in, in when he was just speaking a second ago. But we often have things that create problems for us and the, uh, it, within finance management. And when we don't really have the capacities and the systems to solve them quickly, they do drag on for a bit longer. And things like the large hospital set aside and some of the governance issues that we mentioned earlier on are things that are there that are difficult to deal with and our inability to solve them quickly is symptomatic of the same kind of problem about capacities and systems. Uh, yeah. So yeah, just linking the two things that Peter flagged up with, with George's explanation, just to kind of draw that together and link back to what we've said in other reports. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Bell. Thanks, Chair. Um, I guess I was hoping for a sense of how people with physical disabilities and their carers and, and their families have coped with um, COVID throughout the piece of, with, you know, increased isolation, perhaps, and, and I know from some of my caseload, housing um, moves have been held up because, you know, we've not we just not been able to do it. But I'm concerned about the mental health aspect of that on, on people with physical disabilities and their families and um, what sort of impact that might be having on, on services. Uh, wider than physical disabilities, but also within that, um, um, perhaps around respite, for example, um, if, if we can get a sense, it might be that some people are very resilient and able to cope with with the COVID experience, but um, if anyone can give me a flavour of that, I'd be really grateful. Thanks. I, I can, uh, Julie. Um, I would say it's been mixed. Um, so people's response to COVID has been sometimes very anxious, um, not wanting to continue to receive services. Um, people with kind of complex health needs being reluctant to have service providers coming into the house or to attend services. And of course, we were prohibited from having our services, our, our daycare facilities and planned respite. Uh, open and, until uh, the end of August, um, until the, the government gave us permission to do that. Um, so I, I think the period up until then, and in, in some ways falling on from then, has been one of huge strain on service users and families. We're very aware of that. Um, we knew it anyway, but carers tell us and individual people tell us and, uh, and so on. Um, We've always been able to provide emergency respite when that, that uh, then we had permission to do that. That's always been there. Um, but we have been working on uh, reopening the LD day centres. Uh, I think they were, are due to open any time or may have within the last couple of days. But it's in a, and also we are considering the risk assessments. Um, we meet every Thursday to do that for uh, the opening of the Older People's Day Centres. Same process for, for the LD ones. That's, it's a multi-agency decision when, when we approve the risk assessments. Um, real recognition from all providers that it's a period of a tremendous strain. Um, and what, what we've arrived at, really, and we've run this past the Scottish Government, is a blended model where we're, we're combining, all, all the providers are combining outreach and centre-based uh, support. And the reason for that is because the, the restraints or constraints from for responding to COVID, social distancing, use of PPE, all the rest of it, make it almost impossible to deliver the normal services in the, the day centres. And we're having to go for a blended model outreach and, and centre based. So we've, we've signed off some of those risk assessments more on the table at tomorrow's meeting. So we are beginning to get some movement in the return to, to normal. Um, we had permissions from the government to be as adaptable as we could possibly be in responding to to SDS and you know be more flexible about that and we've tried to really max out on that um, so that you know family members could be used and so on there are some situations where that's legally uh, not possible but we've tried to be really responsive to that but you know no matter what we have done I wouldn't minimize for a minute the strain that, that families have been under yeah but we're, we're, we're moving, let's say that. Yeah. Thank, thanks for that, George. Um, 
do we have any more questions before we move to recommendations? Alison. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Oh, Catherine, I think you wanted to come in as well, but my question is around the involvement of health. And I think there was a survey monkey had gone out to health uh, asking advice before development, but from a health perspective, we've not been involved in developing these proposals yet. And I certainly have a strong appreciation for the role of physiotherapists and OTs in determining the, you know, the, the, the likely solutions that might help people live indep as independently as possible. And certainly in your paper, you talk there about health inequalities. And I feel that from, certainly from a primary care and step perspective, we have a key role in working together. And I do feel that we have integrated teams on the ground, but I would have liked to have seen more health involvement in, in terms of how we develop this proposal. I appreciate you're saying there's a lot of restrictions due to COVID. So my question is around moving forward, how do we make sure that what, before we go out to the public, that we have adequate um, um, expertise from a health perspective in yeah. terms of what the proposal might be, and just to enable us to um, make sure that we're exploring all um, possibilities that might help people from an integrated perspective and integrated teams that might support these people. Okay, Alison, I, I'm going to bring uh, Fiona and uh, Linda in on that one, but I would like to just make one comment myself. I, I, I can't remember where in the report, but we did say something about the, the, the services not being fully integrated in the same way that the LD ones are. And that's it's really to do with just the way that they've been established. Um, historically, the, the LD services have been more integrated within the whole system. And because PD is a brand new service, we just aren't at the same place. But obviously, we would we would like to be so. And that is one of our, our objectives. But I'll bring in uh, Fiona and Linda to, to answer your, your question. Um, who wants to go first? Fiona, do you want to come in? Um, yeah, I think I totally agree, Alison. I think it's absolutely vitally important in physical disabilities that health are, are fully involved. Maybe just to explain, you know, sort of about um, how that involvement has um, happened so far. So the Survey Monkey, you know, went out to, um, you know, carers and people who use the services and all the staff um, teams across, you know, the partnership, including, you know, so all the health and social care, everybody in the senior leadership team. So people have had that opportunity to input um, their ideas towards drafting up this first draft plan, if you like. So agreeing what the priority areas should be, giving us their views on that. So all those views are what we use to actually draft, draft up what is hopefully now going to go out for further consultation. So health staff have, have been involved in that and have had that opportunity to input and will continue you know, to um, have a real focus um, in the next part of the consultation. Um, so you know, we were hoping that after, if we get approval today to go out to public consultation, then that will be the first time that anybody will have seen a draft of the plan that has come through the initial engagement survey monkey. So that's, yeah, that's how it evolved. Presumably, Fiona, that, that would have included AHPs because they've got a very important role here. It did include, yeah, it did include them, yeah. George, you know, so the survey came yeah, on the website, it went on your leadership team, etc. Um, but it's just about that bit where, you know, we, we really need an approval today before we can take what we've drafted from everyone's feedback and um, to go back out and really start to have more detailed conversations um, from them and they can see that draft and they can begin to input what's important for them to be in there. Alison, do you want to come, come in on that? Yeah, I appreciate the survey Monkey went to SLT. That includes some health representatives but it doesn't include general practice or clinical partnership group, or and certainly I hadn't seen it, and the lead HPs within the health service hadn't seen the develop, haven't seen the development proposal or been involved in any of the developments since the uh, survey monkey. So I would like to, to make sure that what's in it is the right thing, you know, from a health perspective before it goes out. And I also think there's some assumptions about what might be the right answer for health. So George, you were saying there that learning disabilities, the having the combined team works for learning disabilities. I think that's making an assumption that this, a similar model might work for physical disabilities, but doesn't take to, into account the physical disabilities affects a much greater proportion of the population. Uh, and no, it's, it's different. So, 
so you're slightly I'm, I'm misunderstood. Really... You're slightly mm -hmm. misunderstood what I meant. I meant the the approach to the improvement planning, the way we've taken that uh, progress forward. I don't think the issues are exactly the same from a health perspective for the PD and LD group. That's not what I meant. No. Okay, it's just it's just that there might be a way of rather than combining services, have different pathways that allow people with physical disabilities to be aligned with what how health working and if there's a communication between social work and health that's wrong rather than having to to to, to change and combine services that that, that would be it, it's quite so important to remember these, these are not purely social work teams the ILD and the, the PD teams are, are not just composed of social workers they have health staff as well health staff in them as well uh, can uh, in terms of moving to the recommendations, it sounds um, that there needs to be a little bit more clinical input um, before we're able to agree um, that it goes for public consultation. Um, Catherine, I see your hand up and I also see Jill's hand up. Um, do you want to come in, Catherine, first? Yes, thanks. Um, so I had a very practical comment which was just that some of the colour scheme in the diagrams is not that accessible so it might need just to be um, checked before it does go anywhere else. Um, but the, the other more substantive point was just that there's there's some reference to self-directed support um, in the, the paper but I'm wondering whether or not there's, there's perhaps something more explicit that needs to be uh, in there in terms of the improvement and any review in action around that, but that was uh, more of a, an addition rather than a fundamental rewrite if uh, folk thought that was helpful. Okay, thanks for that. And Jill. Thank you, Chair. Just, I'll be very quick just to give um, some assurance that Angela Murphy as the lead AHP has been in contact with Fiona and um, is going to be involved in the kind of development of the implementation plan to support um, this paper. Um, so that, that has taken place. So just to give a bit of assurance around that. Alison, have you received enough assurance with regard to clinical input into this? Um, because basically we're being asked to approve it to go out for public consultation and we as an IJB need to be sure that it is ready before it goes out for public consultation. I would like to for Angela to have seen the improvement uh, proposals for she hadn't certainly a week ago or, or a week to two weeks ago when I first was, uh, saw the papers and raised the, the question. So I would like to just have assurance that we've we had a chance to look at it from a health perspective and just check that whatever's going in. I don't think it's likely to change um, hugely the, the content of the development proposal. I think certainly some of the wording and, and uh, would be around looking with health as to what the solutions would be rather than maybe having some of the suggestions already there. I think that there's much that we could do and I don't have that assurance at present because I don't know that we've had enough time to reflect and have these conversations first. So Fiona and Linda and George, are you happy to take that away and ensure there's a, a bit more um, clinical input before it goes to public consultation? Yes, we can do that. Thank you. Okay, so in terms of the recommendations for that, um, we are asking for a bit more um, to be done in terms of the clinical input before it goes to public consultation, but we're noting the current priorities and requesting a further progress report in February 2021. Is everybody happy with that? Uh, Chair, can I just check, um, would you be happy for the authority for us to go ahead with the consultation after we've had further consultation with clinical colleagues? rather than wait till February to bring it back. We would like to bash on if we can. <laughs> Is everybody else happy with that? Yes, yes, yep. I wouldn't want this held up, Chair. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thanks. I, I think perhaps just making sure that we are happy that it's the right thing before it goes out to the public. So I'm happy to maybe agree that by email discussion as soon as possible, as soon as we've had time to clarify that we're, we're not saying the wrong thing in the public. Okay. Okay, thanks for that. Um, Chair, Chair, sorry, there's a, there's a number of blue hands that's been raised, and I don't know whether members have forgotten to take their hands down, but we still have Councillor Bell, Councillor Speed, and Gillian Galloway. I, I can't see any hands at all for some reason, just <laughs> hands. So, um, if, sorry, if mine's down now. Right, okay. Think, Chair, sorry, Councillor Speed has a blue oh, hand right. up. Thank you. Sorry, I don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah. I, I put my hand up for a wee while, but it's maybe just not shown on your screen, Emma Jane. 
Um, it was just really to pick up on the point that Catherine had said around accessibility and the, the graphics and the color and the print. Um, that would be good to see that um, improved. And also just kind of uh, carrying on from Councillor Bell's comments with regards to housing, which was, I think she was alluding to kind of during COVID and the impact, but just also within that bit of work um, as to whether that could perhaps be expanded as well um, because we know that people's access to kind of uh, outdoor but also indoor space particularly housing uh, has, has a huge impact and it'll have an impact on their independence and their, their ability and potential if those environments aren't right so um, I just wondered if maybe George can quickly touch on what works are done around the kind of the broader wider work of our local authority and housing I'm not quite understanding the question, Lewis. Well, I, I noticed within the report, housing was one of the main things that people felt impacted on their lives if their housing circumstances weren't right, but also kind of that wider world and access to, to the built environment as well. Because if people aren't managing to access, then perhaps they're needing more care at home, but if their home uh, environment isn't right, so it will all have a knock-on effect in terms of the level of support they need if they're not able to be as independent as possible. So yeah, it was just some assurances around that as to- Yeah, we do, we do see that as, as, a, as a high priority and we have joint strategic planning uh, forums with housing. I know Fiona's involved in some of those. And in fact, uh, Fiona and myself had a meeting with housing colleagues last Friday about these sort of matters. So we, yeah, we would plan jointly for the future. If that's not coming across clearly enough, Lois, maybe we need to, to make sure it does and, and to emphasize that a bit. More I clearly, would emphasize yeah. that a little bit more. Okay, yeah, Thanks. yeah, yeah. It's a question Thank of you. emphasis, maybe. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's not coming out strongly enough. No yeah. problem. Yeah, oh, okay. Thanks for that, everybody. Um, if, if we're able to move on now to uh, agenda item uh, 11, which is learning disability priority improvements, we have similar recommendations as to, to the last paper. And I think, George, if you want to, uh, in the interest of time, just really draw draw out the very key well, from this report for for I will do, uh, the 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 planning for the ld priority improvements plans a bit more advanced uh, this is our our, our second uh, um version uh, the igb has been well informed about the learning disability developments through i think we've had five reports to igb between 2018 and 21 and we're working on our, our, our new three-year plan it's been a bit delayed due to covid as as you would expect and it's attached here um, so this plan refocuses on the key things are the impact of demographic, demographic pressures, uh, autism and learning disability, the focus on preventative work, uh, support to carers, including respite, uh, improving uh, community outreach um, uh, to support the learning disability day centres and outreach work they're doing, uh, additional focus on supported accommodation uh, and addressing health inequalities. Those are the main things that we're, we're looking to focus on. And it's the same thing, we're, we're, we're seeking permission to progress to another stage uh, um, with the improvement plan and put that out into, uh, for, circula uh, for uh, consultation. That was quick. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, George. Um, so questions um, for George and the team. Peter. Thanks, Emma Jane. Um, uh, just a, a couple of comments, very quick comments. Um, on page 152, under engagement, it says this plan is based on what people have said about things could be improved, blah, blah, blah. Um, I assume this is the, what I think of as the Linda um, survey that went out earlier in the year. Um, and if so, uh, we should bear in mind before this goes to consultation about the surveys that were run by both Sally and by um, Angus Carers Centre, um, which were all about um, learning disabilities, which are about carers and, and about hospitalisation. And they might provide some good input before it goes out to, uh, to consultation. 
What I didn't say about the previous report, but applies to this report, is I think they're both well written, they're very readable. Take the comment about um, the colour of the charts, I think that needs reviewing. Um, and the final comment is the, the last one I had on the previous report, which is uh, at some point I'd like to see the priorities um, and timescales for the, the improvement list. Thanks for that, Peter. And Thanks, does anyone Peter. come back to that or? No, and do we have any more questions? Chair, I've got Catherine Lindsay. Yep. Just Catherine. a comment. So a comment, please, Chair, um, and just a, a similar comment to, to that in the previous report, it's just around considering the visibility of self-directed support as part of the improvement. Yeah, point, point taken, Catherine. I think we tend to see it in, in, as inherent in everything we do, but I, I know the kind of lived reality for service users is that SDS is, and their families is pretty challenging at times, yeah. So. Okay. Um... Are we happy to um, approve the the, uh, the learning disability improvement plan for public consultation, noting the current priorities and requesting a further progress report in February 2021? Yes. Okay, thanks for that. We'll move on to uh, item 12 now, which is the Chief Social Work Officer annual report. Um, and Catherine, I assume this is you. Um, I, Think we are to note this report so if you'd like to uh, highlight any pertinent issues for the board that'd be really helpful thanks thanks very much um chair so colleagues who have been on this committee for some time will know um how how this report is laid out it comes once a year it's a statutory report that i take to angus council for approval and then onward submission um to the scottish government um, so that approval at Angus Council um, occurred at the last meeting in September and so it's now being put before yourselves um, for any uh, further uh, discussion um, and noting. Um, it, it covers all of social work and social care um, in Angus. Um, it, it refers to, although it doesn't go into all of the detail of the different kinds of supports that are available for people and the extent to which they are being um, delivered well. Um, it, it really is a kind of summary report rather than a, a detailed report. And in fact, IGB members will be um, very well versed in um, particularly the areas of responsibility that you uh, are, are concerned with around adult health and social care um, business because you receive uh, performance reports regularly on most of the areas that are covered uh, in this report. But myself or colleagues on the call, I'm sure will be able to answer any particular questions um, that you have today. Thank you. Thanks very much for that, Catherine. Um, it's a very detailed and helpful report, um, and I'd, I'd note um, the, the acknowledgement of a lot of input from HSCP staff in terms of the content, definitely. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Catherine? No? So we're happy to, to note that report. Thank you. So moving on to agenda item 13, which is the communication and engagement plan. Um, October 2020 to September 2023. Um, and I will pass over to Sally for this uh, report, thanks. Thank you, Chair. Um, so this report is the partnership's second communication and engagement plan, and it was developed by the communication and engagement group. But I'd like to particularly thank the input from Andrew um, Andrew Jack and our colleagues from Healthcare Improvement Scotland community engagement team who've been very helpful. Um, so the plan sets out how we will engage and involve staff and our partner organisations and local people to ensure that all improvement and transformational activities are informed by strong stakeholder feedback. And it's important to recognise that really our reputation depends on how we engage and inform and listen and involve and interact with people. Um, so the plan was presented to the strategic planning group on the 16th of September and it was approved by, by them. And included in the plan are some examples of some of the communication and engagement activities that have taken place since the establishment of Angus Health and Social Care Partnership. And the plan lists six objectives and describes the principles and standards that will guide our communication and engagement activities. 
And the action plan is attached as an appendix and identifies a number of activities that will be undertaken in order to achieve these objectives. And obviously the plan recognizes that we will need to adapt and change the way in which we engage um, with people in relation to um, COVID-19. And within the report, I think it's pertinent to, to reference the fact that we said that we were meant, uh, we were waiting for guidance from the Scottish government about um, how we would engage with, um, with people and the national standards for community engagement engaging with our communities to support recovery and renewal has since been published and it helps us to think about how we can engage with our communities during and after the, the, the pandemic and highlights the importance of engaging with people with lived experience of disadvantage and inequity. So now more so than ever we need to consider good quality community engagement with, with people. And we do work really closely with Voluntary Action Angus and a number of our partner agencies in order to achieve this. Um, so um, basically I'm just uh, asking you to, to note the content of the report and request an update of our about our activities. Um, and to reassure you that an equality impact assessment has been undertaken. It wasn't attached with this report, but it has been undertaken. Um, we will be hopefully taking this out to our design colleagues for um, for um, kind of smartening up before it goes before it goes live. And just to reassure people that we will do a final sweep for for typos um, and um, before it goes before it goes completely live. So, thank you. Thanks very much for that, Sally. I think this is a, I think it's a really good report. I think it's a really important plan. Um, I think um, it highlights a lot of the good work that's happening in this area, and which is increasingly being informed by the, the kind of restrictions that COVID has placed on engagement. Um, and I think, as you said, engagement is becoming increasingly, increasingly important um, as lots of changes have to be made quite quickly. Um, and we are adapting all the time and there are some very innovative ideas coming out with regard to uh, how we engage with, with our local communities. And um, so I thought this was a very important paper to include within, within our agenda today. Does anybody have any questions or comments for Sally? Here we have Councillor Bell, Gail and Catherine Lindsay. Okay, Councillor Bell. Well, you kind of stole my thunder, Imogen. Um, I I know how much work goes into these, Sally, and it's it's lovely to see such a comprehensive, multi-layered approach, um, uh, and the challenges that that we have. Um, I think it's going to be a long time before we're post-COVID. Um, so this this will continue to be a real challenge for us. But it's also really heartening to see that so many of our third sector partners have um, engaged with the people they're working with around the use of tech. Um, so, for example, Kerry Connections are still providing a service. Angus Women's Aid is providing a service uh, because they've been able to provide children with iPads uh, and what have you. So I think, you know, as, as much as our partnership in the broadest sense can do to support those communications um, I, th I think that it is brilliant to see that partnership really deepen um, because of the the COVID response but if there's if there's you know anything that that we can do as elected members for example or board members you know really eager to be ambassadors for what the IGB is doing and um support in the key messages for you as well um, and if, if there are from my point of view if there are any zoom meetings engagement with with people i'd absolutely be delighted to be part of that um, because you know we need to communicate with our different stakeholders in any way that we can thank you councillor bell i appreciate that um uh, Karen, who else was it? I can't see any hands up. So, Gail, I can actually see your hand up. And was there anybody else as well? Ka Sorry, Gail, Catherine, Lindsay, and Councillor Speed. Okay. Gail, do you want to go ahead now? Yeah, Chair, I would also like to thank Sally as the lead um, and 
um, leading this on behalf of the Communication and Engagement Group for her input, particularly um, as she's been heavily involved in supporting us around the COVID pandemic as well. Um, and to complete this is, is immensely helpful. And as she said already, and I have also said in the foreword, a reputation is very much um, on how we inform, engage, listen, involve and interact with everybody, our stakeholders and our VAA, third sector, carers, etc. So thank you, Sally. Thanks, Gail. Catherine? Thank you. Um, it, it was just to, to pick up on the particular health inequalities um, that we know are evidenced um, by care leavers and people with experience of the justice system. So it was just a, a, as part of the, the board's corporate parenting responsibilities would be helpful um, to consider how you might link with the local corporate parenting board um, to reach out to care leavers and those with care experience and also similarly the community justice partnership which I know the health and social care partnership are also represented on but it was just to make those um, two groups explicitly visible in our consideration today. Thank you. And Lois? Yeah, thanks. Just a huge thanks to Sally, because I know how hard she works um, with regards to communication and uh, reaching out to ensure that, you know, we're accessible in various formats. So it was just to really kind of, I guess, stress again, just the importance of um, being able to, to provide just that, especially for those that are digitally excluded and are not connected with us um, through virtual means. And also just um, whether maybe we can ensure uh, we continually offer kind of easy read and BSL formats or links with um, other interpreters as well of, so that we, we really can reach out to our, our whole community. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Cassius. Yeah. So thank, thanks for that, everybody. Yeah. We're all... Yeah. Yep, Hugh. I, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, just, just quickly. Uh, just to thank Sally for this report. It's a really good report. Um, thoroughly enjoyed reading it. I'm really interested to see at the very end um, the, 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 the desire to explore the potential of using care opinion to get feedback from, from patients and service users. And I particularly hope that that, that involves the NHS side of the house, because as you know, Chair, at Performance and Resources, our, our only sort of indication of how we're doing is through complaints. And, you know, we should be doing a lot wider sort of um, type consumer type surveys to, to see what people feel. And I'm, I'm really excited uh, about the prospect of going down that route. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, thanks for all those comments and, and thank you, Sally. And I think um, we are therefore um, noting the content of the plan, noting the progress that's been made and requesting an annual progress report on, on how the action plan is implemented. Okay, well, that takes us to the end of our public business for the IJB today. Um, I'd just like to say a huge thanks to all of the staff that have provided input of their time and reports. Um, um, and now I believe IGB members we need to leave this call and, and join another call for um, the exemption reports. Chair, sorry, before we before we all disconnect, can we actually look at item 14 where we agree to exclude public and press before we, we end the meeting? Apologies. Right. Yep. So um, we are being asked to consider in terms of paragraph three, four, six and nine of part one of schedule seven H, the Local Government Scotland Act 1973, whether the public and press should be excluded during consideration of the following two items as to avoid the disclosure of exempt information. And are we happy with that? Great. Great. Okay, thank you, everybody. Um, if we then leave this call um, and we will join um, for the two exempt items. Thank you. Ali, could you stop recording, please? Right, we'll do that.